This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room. Yeah, I'll lead into order and we are now in public session. And can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to keep all members in the spotlight for the next four items and welcome everyone to this public meeting of the Education Committee. Agenda item one is apologies. Are members aware of any apologies? No. Nope. Okay, then agenda item two, chairperson's business. Can I inform the committee that members had an informal meeting on Tuesday with Karen Mullen, MLA, regarding her private member's bill on holiday hunger? Uh, no firm timescale yet for the introduction of the bill, but prog good progress is being made and it will likely come to the committee in due course. Uh, record of the meeting is tabled today. Um, obviously an issue that um, the executive uh, made pro significant progress on, um, introducing the direct payments for, for free school meals during all holiday periods. So hopefully the bill uh, can build on that progress and uh, Karen um, will be successful with uh, that proposal. Okay then, members, uh, agenda item three is draft minutes. Can I refer members to draft minutes of the committee meetings of the 23rd of March and the 24th of March, at pages six and nine of your meeting packs and seek your agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings. Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Okay, members, there are no matters arising, which takes us to agenda item five and our oral briefing from Autism NI on mandatory teacher training. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all members from the spotlight and to add our witnesses? Can I refer members to a briefing note from the committee clerk at page 17, a briefing paper from Autism NI at page 20, an extract from Hansard of the plenary debate on autism training in schools on the 3rd of February 2020 at page 25 and correspondence from the Education Minister on autism training at page 44. Clark, are our witnesses with us? Not yet. I think you're on mute, Clark. That's um, okay. Oh, there they are. Okay. Um... Yeah, they're not. I'll, do, I'll just, yeah. Well, there's, like, there's Kerry now. Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. give Assembly Broadcasting time to bring our, our witnesses in, but in, in so doing, can I, I welcome Kerry Boyd, the Chief Executive Officer of Autism MI. Kerry, I, th I think you're being joined by Kelly and Christine, is that right? Um, yes, Christine Kearney is joining us, who's the Director of Development at Autism and I. Um, Kelly has um, a family emergency, which happened last night, so unfortunately she won't be able to be here today. Okay. So, sorry to hear that, and if you extend mm -hmm. our regards to, to Kelly for that, um, mm -hmm. wish her, wish her uh, a good outcome in relation to that. Um, you're very welcome, though, Kerry, uh, with Christine. Um, can I advise uh, you and Christine that the committee We'll give you 10 minutes to make an opening statement, and that'll be followed by questions and discussion with the members, um, which can be answered by any of you. Um, so you're, you're, you're very welcome. Um, I'll hand over to you. Has Christine arrived in, Chris? Sorry. I'm not sure I see her yet, actually. We'll give her a moment. Um, Yes, can you give her just a wee minute? Because I think yeah. we're told the quarter nine early, I think. <laughs> okay, no problem. Clark, are there any other items you want us to progress while we're just giving uh, Christine a moment there for the 9.15 start? Yeah, I think you're on mute. We could start into correspondence if you wish. Sure. Okay. Yeah, we, we can make we can make a start. Yeah, just to just to give uh, Christine a minute there if we if we'd advised that the the slot was a nine fifteen start. Okay. That okay? Sure. Okay. Happy, happy enough for that, Kerry? Yeah. As soon as I see Christine, I'll come I'll, I'll come back to to you okay, guys. Um, okay. So if uh, Assembly Broadcasting could bring uh, members back into the spotlight. And we'll move to agenda item seven. Clark, I'm getting echo of myself. Are, are other people getting that, or can you hear me okay? 
I can hear you okay, Chair. Okay, that, that's good. All right. Okay. Um, so, members, correspondence starts on page 81 of your pack. Um, there are 34 items, and as usual, there's a summary page at page 83. Um, I'll just highlight some items. Item 7.2 on page 88 is a response from the department providing background and explanation for the decision to close St Mary's High School of Brawla. Um, are members content to note that and forward the response to the correspondent who raised it initially? Content. Read that note. I heard I raised that previously. Yep, content to agree that. Pat, yep. Sorry, Joe. I mean, yeah. it, 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 it's disappointing um, that the ministers go ahead with this original decision because, and, and, and perhaps one time the committee might have a, a, a broader conversation around the issue of, uh, of area planning and the the view that I have that one place does not fit all, that there have to be some exceptions to the room. Uh, and I suppose we need to have a discussion at some stage with the minister about how he proceeds on that basis. Uh, because I mean, I let me fair, it's all politics. There's no words for Peter Weir uh, in that neck of the woods. He... Uh, he can go ahead and close Pat, that. Pat, Pat, sorry, sorry to pause you for a moment. Could I just ask other members to make sure they're on uh, mute at, at this stage while other members are speaking? Thanks. Go ahead, Pat. Yeah, there's there's a lot of feedback there. Um, you know, as as I say, I mean, the the minister has made the decision to close the school. Uh, it's not going to affect him politically in that area. Uh, and, and and that's always one of the, the drawbacks when you have a plan that doesn't allow for any sort of uh, exclusion to or exception to the plan. Uh, and, you know, what happens when there is a school that's particularly isolated? Uh, so, so, but, I mean, I, I think it's too far gone now to make any change, but I just want to express my own disappointment. Thanks. Thanks, Pat. And I think you raised some important points in terms of uh, appropriate area planning um, for uh, for areas across Northern Ireland in those different contexts. Um, perhaps it'd be appropriate if the Education Committee responds to the Education Minister just to ask for full clarity around what alternative arrangements are going to be put in place for pupils affected by this closure, because I, I realise it does create significant challenges uh, for many of those pupils. Would members be content with that action? Agreed? Chair, Chair I think just to follow yeah, on from Dan. what I said, uh, maybe in terms of our line of work going forward, it would do no harm just to look at area planning and how uh, school closures uh, are happening and where and what. what it, basically, if, if their schools amalgamating, is it being coordinated properly or if it's just straight closure? Because like I'm aware of other examples. Like there's a, a brutal example. I not name them on public record now, but there's a, a brutal example that I'm aware of where quite a number of schools came together into a, a much smaller site, no facilities whatsoever for uh, the children in terms of the actual estate, uh, which in the long term would make that school less attractive than one that's further down the road and potentially make it unsustainable. So th th there's big issues about how these things are being operated, uh, and I think really we should divert our attention to it at, at, at some stage soon. Okay. Yep. Content to agree my proposed response to the Education Minister and for us to take a, a substantive session on area planning. Members, agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Morning, okay, Robert. Clark, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, members, we can continue with correspondence. Our other witness is, is now with us, but um, we can finish this Sorry. item. If that's okay, okay. Fin um, yeah, finish this one item and then we'll go back to autism and I. Thank you, Clark. Um, so, you want to continue with correspondence? Yeah. Just did you just say one one more item? I, I'm 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 content to pause there if you want and return to autism and I. Yeah, can be. Is that okay? Okay, Th thanks for that, Clark. I, I see that we have uh, Kerry Boyd and Christine Kearney with us. If Assembly Broadcasting could remove members from the spotlight and add our witnesses, uh, that would be great. Okay.
Kerry and Christine, you're both very welcome again. We'll, we'll, we're ready to start. We'll hand over to you guys for your opening statement, and then we we'll look forward to engaging with you on questions and discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, okay, so today I'm here to present on the critical need for mandatory autism training for all teaching staff in Northern Ireland, and that it needs to be implemented as a matter of urgency. Autism and I, um, as many of you know, is the longest serving autism charity in Northern Ireland. We were established back in 1990 and we provide life saving, um, life changing services for the autism community here. We provide a family support service, which includes a helpline, which takes over 5,000 phone calls every year um, from autistic adults, parents, carers, and also professionals. We also have a support group network, um, which facilitates over 22 support groups throughout um, Northern Ireland and an early intervention service that provides over 2,000 families um, support every year. The organisation fully understands the needs and priorities of our autism families here. Um, we have continual engagement with autistic adults, families, parents and um, professionals about autism. The charity is also the longest serving um, autism training provider in Northern Ireland and we've been doing that for over 20 years. We provide accredited training for over 2,000 professionals every year. We're also, as you know, as Chris knows, uh, involved in lobbying and awareness raising um, for autism um, supports and services. And we provide the all party group um, on autism secretariat. As you know, um, for those that don't know, autism is a developmental disability and it influences the way a person interacts and communicates and sees the world around them. It is a spectrum condition, which means it varies from person to person. And for that reason, um, you know, so many people and children with autism have varying um, issues, one of which, one of the main issues at the minute is education. Statistics for Northern Ireland are incredibly high. We have um, one in 24 school age children being diagnosed with autism. Um, and there has been a huge prevalence increase um, with the diagnosis of autism, particularly over the past 10 years. 6.4% um, of males um, school age children in Northern Ireland are being diagnosed with autism. That is one in 16 boys um, and there's one in 50 girls. We know that there's usually about three times more boys and girls um, who are, give, are given a diagnosis of autism. 14% of autistic children, however, do not have a special educational need. The vast majority of children are in mainstream education. Only 22% of autistic adults are in any type of employment, whether that be full-time or part-time. And this is less than half of the average of people with a disability within the UK. And as I'm sure you agree, it's completely unacceptable. We receive as a charity over 5,000 phone calls every year. And education remains to be one of the most um, needed supports within, um, within those phone calls. We did uh, an education survey ourselves um, a few years back and over 120 parents um, took part in that survey. And within that survey, even though it was a charity based one we did ourselves, um, a third of those parents have said that their children are on reduced timetables. Therefore, they're not getting the full education experience. A recent survey conducted in 2020 on the private members bill, which has been put forward by Pam Cameron, DUP, MLA, had over 1,800 responses and it showed that over 95% of those respondents felt that compulsory accredited training um, in autism within our schools is needed. So the overall issue is back in September 2019, the charity um, did a petition on mandatory autism training for all teaching staff in Northern Ireland. We had a huge response. Over 10,000 people um, signed that petition within only a, a few days. Subsequently, a motion um, by Pam Cameron, who's the chairperson of the All-Party Group in Autism, was proposed and all mandatory teacher training and it was debated within the chamber in February 2020. Within this debate, um, there was unanimous cross-party agreement, um, including the Minister for Education, that mandatory teacher training should be introduced as a matter of urgency within Northern Ireland. However, to this date, it still hasn't happened. Minister Weir did announce in December 2020 that more online training for teaching staff throughout Northern Ireland would be available, but this is not mandatory, and this is what the petition was about. This contradicts, in my view, um, the commitment he made um, at the start of 2020 to make this training mandatory. Teachers can access this new online training in their own time, 
suggesting it is pre-recorded and not interactive, and most importantly, not mandatory. The Department of Education, um, as you guys know, has invested substantial resources into autism training um, materials and a program of support um, through middle time over the past 14 years, as well as the Education Authority's Autism Advisory Service. Given that every single teacher in Northern Ireland will teach multiple autistic children throughout their careers, um, we believe that every teacher needs to be trained up in this. It should never be a lottery whether a child receives um, is able to gain that correct support from a teacher who understands them and gets their full support needs met. The latest correspondence um, from Minister Weir, uh, which was um, provided to the All-Party Group on Autism, was dated back in January 2020 of this, 2021 of this year. And it states that over 11,000 teachers have availed of autism training so far. There's no indication whether these are 11,000 individual entities or 11,000 participants. So that could be one teacher has done three courses, but 11,000 people have attended 11,000 courses. Um, either way, this is still, from what I've looked at the figures, half of the teaching population in Northern Ireland. The failure to implement mandatory autism training means that the situation for our children is, remains exactly the same. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic, as you can understand, has exasperated this even further. And for me, the need for this mandatory autism teacher training to be implemented, as was promised over a year ago, needs to happen and needs to happen now. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Christine, who is our Director of Development, to give you an example of a child who was discriminated against because of their autism within the school phase. Thanks, Kerry. Um... So I'm, as Kerry said, I'm going to just uh, talk through a case study and then provide some information around what we feel would be uh, a positive solution to addressing some of these concerns. So in regards to the case study, this was a case study that we worked with this family through a request of support uh, via our helpline service. The family consisted of mum, dad and two children, uh, one of which uh, was autistic and subject to a statement of special educational needs. Um, so the request for support came in uh, when the child was excluded from a class trip and suspended on or suspended from school on occasions as a result of their behaviour, which was argued arose as a as a direct result of their disability. So to give you some background to the situation, um, the family was consistently reassured by the school that the child was doing well uh, within the classroom through reports, through meetings and um, through um, statement uh, meetings. And no autism services were um, required at that stage. Um, so the parents and family felt um, that there was really no worries around inclusion uh, across the whole school curriculum, including in school trips. So within days of the school trip invite being um, issued to all of the children, um, the family were informed that the trip was unsuitable for their child uh, via a verbal risk assessment. Um, this led to a lot of confusion uh, for the whole family, but including for that child who was aware of the trip and who was excited to uh, attend the trip. Um, there was a lot of feelings of anxiety and feelings of exclusion for the child uh, where they weren't sure really what they were going to be doing while all the other children were going on their trip. Um, so the family tried to engage with the school to discuss what could be adapted to provide support to allow the child to attend school or to attend the school trip and to participate actively uh, within their special educational needs report. Um, there was a real focus on helping the child to socially integrate and, and socially um, connect with their peers. Um, and the parents really felt that this would be a really good opportunity to be able to do that. So they were really keen on working with the school to allow the child to participate in this. Um, Weeks after this, um, there was a written risk assessment that was provided to the parents, um, which then actually just focused on the needs uh, of the child arising from their disability. Um, and there was little to no consideration within that written risk assessment um, around adjustments that could be provided for that child to uh, attend the school trip. Um, parents were, um, as you can imagine, really disappointed with this and further issues within the school then after the, the school trip led to two suspensions being given to the child, uh, which parents felt again was uh, due directly to the child's disability and the lack of appropriate support that was being given to the child to manage anxieties and manage behaviours. For example, uh, one of the strategies that, that the school talked about was that the child could go to their safe place underneath their desk um, in front of the rest of the classroom, which the parents really weren't uh, happy with and, and didn't feel was an appropriate level of support. 
So the parents, um, you know, looking at all of the evidence and looking at the, the impacts on their child and their whole family, um, looked at the option of a special needs tribunal um, and went through that tribunal process. The tribunal found that um, the child and the family was subjected to unlawful discrimination relative to both the school trip and the unlawful exclusions. Um, Overall, the, the tribunal summarised that the school failed to make reasonable adjustments for the child based on their disability um, and uh, that the school exclusion should be expunged from their report. Um, or sorry, from the child's um, report and history. The So the, the tribunal really supported the family to understand a little bit more about what happened and to to have their rec have their worries recognised that their child wasn't receiving the right level of support um, and was being discriminated against based on their disability, in this case, uh, autism. But there were wider impacts as well. So after the tribunal was um, considered, the family are now homeschooling this child uh, following the poor support and the negative experiences that the child found um, and, and the impact did the whole family. Um, so there are wider, longer term impacts of, of those things as well as the, um, you know, the initial stress and anxieties that were caused by the whole process. So that's just one example of a family where they're really struggling to receive support and struggling to um, really access the educational experience for their child. Um, now I just want to spend um, our final uh, time with you to uh, talk through really a proposed solution to some of the issues and challenges that we've addressed and talked about. Um, from the available research statistics and from consultation with the autism community, Autism NI recognises that improving provision of teacher training should be focused on two key areas, improving the quality and content of the training and ensuring consistent access to the training across Northern Ireland. So firstly, the quality and content of any autism training should be reviewed and improved to ensure that it really empowers staff in a practical way to support autistic pupils. Importantly, any training delivered should be facilitated live by experienced trainers. This enables the training to be individualised depending on the audience and for staff to ask questions and discuss concerns. There is clear research to show that interaction and discussion is vital to support learning and allow for training to be effective at changing attitudes and practice. Standardised pre-recorded information that staff are not actively engaging in is very unlikely to affect change and more likely to become a tick box bare minimum that's not outcomes focused. Training should be focused on practical support so that teaching staff build knowledge, confidence and skills. Sample strategies should be provided to staff that they implement within the classroom. A best practice approach would be for um, the training to include the creation of an individualised action plan for each school um, to follow as a guide to supporting pupils. This would promote a structured and consistent approach that will be outcomes based and ultimately provide increased supports. The second suggested improvement that we have to training provision is standardising the access to training by making it mandatory for all teaching staff. We want to move away from the inconsistency that pupils currently face when transitioning and progressing from school or through school um, that creates an environment where families have to battle for supports to be provided year after year as children move between classes and between schools. We feel that this is a vital step that needs to be implemented to promote a whole school approach and provide consistent educational support for autistic children in Northern Ireland. Moving to a mandatory approach demonstrates a commitment from the Department of Education that they support and empower teachers within their roles and that they recognise the need for equality within education. The mandatory training could be implemented within the current uh, system of staff development closure days, similar to how safeguarding training is rolled out consistently across schools. Mandatory training should be made available for new teaching staff as well as existing staff and refresher training should be made available to maintain that good practice. So the current prevalence rate of autism and the large body of evidence recognising the current barriers to accessing and attaining education warrants this change. Any improvements to training quality and content will only have limited impact if it's not made mandatory for all teachers across Northern Ireland. We envisage these changes and adaptations to the current system of autism support are reasonable and realistic to achieve. They will make great progress in supporting autistic children's rights to access and attain high quality education. This early support will also avoid many challenges that the Department of Education are currently facing in relation to crisis supports for children and tribunals that proceed due to a lack of appropriate support being provided at an earlier stage, just like in the case study um, that I talked about earlier.
Implementing these changes will be cost effective and support all stakeholders involved. Most importantly, these simple improvements have the potential to positively impact the educational outcomes and wider life opportunities for many autistic individuals, including in the areas of, import, uh, of employment, mental health and social inclusion, all of which we know are such vital um, issues uh, within the autism population. All autistic children have the right to a high quality education. Implementing these changes will improve equality and inclusion for the autism community within education and across the lifespan. Thank you. Thank you, Christine and Kerry. Um, I should probably declare an interest as, at the start as a member of the All-Party Assembly Group on Autism, um, a proud member and very grateful for the, the, the work uh, that Autism NI is doing um, with all the MLAs on the All-Party Group on Autism. Um, it's quite clear from your presentation that at the core, this is about empowering staff uh, mm -hmm. to... Uh, ensure that autistic people get access to the support and the equal educational opportunity to which they're entitled. It's a, it's a rights issue. And you've set out quite clearly a solution there. So my simple question before I bring other MLAs in is, if given that you've got a really good, clear understanding of the, the action that needs to be taken, what, what level of response have you received from the education minister with regards to the specifics of that proposed solution? Well, Chris, we've already, um, we've already met with the Minister for Education um, prior to the um, COVID-19 pandemic, and he seemed at the time um, very encouraged, encouraged about it. And um, now this was before the petition, um, and he understood what needed to be done, I felt at the time. I've also met with John O'Dowd a number of years ago too, um, whenever he was Minister for Education on the same issue. And, you know, it was all very positive. And I felt that within the chamber that day, what he had said that, you know, that, that this was a matter, matter of urgency to introduce this. I thought, felt this was, um, so to speak, a done deal and it would be introduced. However, he has instead um, introduced more online training um, and that online training is still not mandatory, and that is our issue. It has to be mandatory. Every teacher needs to be doing this training if they're teaching an autistic child. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, and obviously, the impact of um, partial school closure and COVID lockdowns has served only to exacerbate um, the, the need exactly. for this mm -hmm. uh, training um, in order to uh, assist pupils to access that education uh, recovery and education uh, opportunity on their return to, to school, yeah? Absolutely, I think, yes, um, so um, over the past... Um... Oh, go ahead, Kerry. <laughs> I'm sorry, my my screen keeps freezing here. By the way, so that's why that, I might seem a bit. I can't sometimes. That's, that's I can't okay. see you. I can hear we you. Can, okay. We we can um, hear just, you. Yes, I need um, clear as well. So you, say, you go ahead, Kerry. Yep. Okay. I wasn't sure, but it keeps freezing. Um. Yes. Over the past year, the pandemic has obviously exacerbated this. Um. So many children have had. All children in Northern Ireland have had an exceptionally hard time where there's been a change in routines and structure. Um, to their day and obviously um, you know last minute lockdowns with schools as well and closures and children having to adapt to that it would make such a difference if that teacher that was working with that child whenever they're being reintroduced back into the classroom understands the autism and understands that they will arguably find it much harder to be re reintroduced to um, the routine again than possibly other children in the classroom. Sorry, Christine, go ahead if you have something to say. No, I was, I was going to say something very similar. Um, so just, um, I suppose, to follow on from Kerry's point, um, we know that autistic individuals have been affected disproportionately because of COVID. Um, and for us, you know, reintroducing school and reintegration back into the classroom without those supports, without that understanding of how COVID has impacted on routines, on um, anxieties, is, is going to be really, really challenging for a lot of those children. And we recognise that there are a lot of parents that have phoned our helpline and, and that we're connected with who have massive anxieties around uh, reintroducing and reintegrating back into school. Um, and the other, the other point that I would make is that actually a lot of the strategies that 
that we would cover and we would explore within autism training or that we would foresee being explored within this autism training would actually, especially at the moment, help a lot of children with anxiety, help a lot of children who are struggling because of COVID or because of other anxieties and, and challenges that they're experiencing. And we always talk about good autism practice actually being really good practice for a lot of children, especially children who have a range of special educational needs or have um, are experiencing challenges. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, we've got. I, I will. We'll write to the education minister on on the agreement of the other members to seek an urgent response to the specific proposals that you're making, given the urgent nature of them. But I've got eight other MLAs uh, to bring in today, and members, uh, if you could try, I'll have to make sure that I keep you to five minutes max today, given uh, our schedule. But can I bring in Deputy Chairperson Pat Sheehan, MLA? Thank you, Chair, uh, and thanks to Carrie and Christine for your presentations. Um, we're very supportive of the need to create greater awareness and training for, for school staff uh, when it comes to autism and other special educational needs. Uh, you know, as you have outlined yourself, there has been an exponential raise in the number of children presenting with autism and special needs, so uh, school staff need to be equipped uh, in dealing with that situation. Now, I, I know the debate took place in the Assembly last year, and although I wasn't present for that at the time, uh, I, I hear there was some confusion around the position of the unions in regard to mandatory training. Um, have you had any engagement with the unions around that issue? And if you had, what, what was the outcome? Thanks. Well, Susan Thompson, um, who was the president of the Ulster Teachers Union, actually spoke at our rally at Stormont um, back in September 20, um, 2019. Um, and she was fully supportive of it. Um, I'm not sure whether it's more from my point of view. I don't think it's an issue. And I would like to say, which probably should have said at the start of this, this is, this is about supporting teachers as, as, as much as it is supporting children with autism. The teachers need to have the right um, training and understanding. They're put in a classroom with possibly two children with autism. And if they don't have the right training, it's a very stressful time for them as well. So this is about as much supporting them as it is our children. Um, but yes, from what I know of, um, I would argue, because I have heard this as well about the teachers unions, and I think it's more about their workload. That's my opinion about doing more training or extra training. Um, but for many teachers that autism and I have to engage with, and we've been around for 30 years, they're very, very receptive of this. And they're actually, Christine, I'll tell you, like they come sometimes on Saturday mornings and pay themselves to do autism training because maybe they have a child in their classroom in their own free time to do it. So we know it's needed and we know that they want it. I think it's a bigger issue. I think it's maybe about extra workload or something. I don't really know the ins and outs of what's going on when they educate, but that's what I feel it is. I don't think it's about the autism training per se. Yeah, and I think, you know, through our helpline, through the training that we provide, um, we we do have families, or sorry, we do have teachers coming on, we do have teachers running our helpline to access supports to try and get visuals so that they can print them at home and then bring them into the classroom. So we know that there's, there's lots of great practice and there's lots of really great um, enthusiasm to support uh, children on the spectrum. It's really for us about um, facilitating a change to help um, the, the teachers feel empowered and to help them feel that actually from, I suppose, the top down from the department, that they are being given the resources and the time to be able to implement that. Um, because the, right now there are lots of teachers who, who currently don't feel that um, and, you know, are really struggling. Um, and we know that teachers, teachers are in the job to be able to support children and we need to empower them to be able to do that for all children, regardless of their disability. Yeah, and thanks for that. And I mean, I absolutely agree with what you're saying. And I think it would be it's a crazy situation where teachers are in classes with autistic children and don't have the required training to deal with that particular condition or other special educational needs. It's crazy. But um, I mean, if, if there is some resistance from the unions, uh, I mean, I think engagement can only help uh, to formulate an agreed way forward so that obstacles aren't there and that 
yourselves, the unions and the department are all in agreement about we, how we move forward on, the, on this issue. So thanks for that. And just one other uh, short question, Chair, if I'm still within my time. Yeah, that's four minutes. That's four minutes. Pat, if you ask your question, the guys are okay. concise. We've got um, time. Thanks. We we heard some very disturbing evidence recently about the use of restraint and seclusion in schools, and I'm wondering if you have had any engagement with the department around the use of uh, restraint and seclusion and the restraint and seclusion policy within schools. Thanks. Um, okay, so we have had, you know, again, over the years of, with our experience, we have had parents who have called us or um, spoken to us about this issue. Um, we know there's a very, there was quite a high profile one that um, also um, presented to you not so long ago, the Education Committee. Um, and yes, I we actually as a charity brought it up, the all-party group, not as Crystal say, about the, the outdated um, policy that there was that from what we what we have read is that each school can um, there I think the policy is 20 years old or something like that and it, that each school can make up their own policy on it which we were horrified about so Autism and I has actually brought that to all party group and Crystal tell you um, maybe six months nine months ago um, yeah so it's, it's a really big concern and obviously autistic children could be disproportionately disadvantage in that as well because it's more likely to happen probably to an autistic child and yes we we are totally behind this that it needs to be updated and each school needs to know what the policy is and what the report mechanisms and that is for it as well yeah and and and, and it does okay. in with the uh the issue of training uh, exactly. teachers you know the the, the, policy, the policy must connect with the with the training that teachers are receiving so I, I would suggest that you raise it as a, a matter of urgency, I think, with the department. Uh, I mean, you're the advocacy group for autistic children, uh, and, and, and that's what the minister needs to hear. So I leave it there, and thanks, Christine, and uh, Gary, again, thank you. That, thanks, Pat. Can I bring in Robin Newton, MLA? Good. Can I thank uh, Autism NI for their uh, presentation this morning. Thank you for your passion, uh, for your concern, uh, and indeed for your clarity uh, around exactly uh, what you've reported to the, to the committee. I share your passion uh, in the sense that every year um, I, I take on, uh, for well, obviously not this year, but uh, take on autism students uh, for work experience. Uh, some of them have been back, one has been back three times uh, for work experience. Um, uh, and they've been students who have been, I think, high on the spectrum uh, and students who have been very low uh, on the spectrum. And I said, first of all, it's been a very positive experience for me. Uh, and the fact that they, they continue to keep in touch with me would suggest it's been a positive experience for them uh, as well. I've, I've been not understanding really uh, the aspects of, until I started to engage with, 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 with the schools and with the students on this. I didn't realize, I think, the potential of some young people who had autism, nor did I, in a general sense, nor did I recognize and understand the potential that some of them have in a specialism that, that can help uh, take them forward uh, for, for their future. So uh, I, I would encourage you, uh, I would encourage the committee, uh, and the chair has already suggested that we write uh, to the minister, but there is obviously something wrong in the blockage if you first started to engage with uh, John O'Dowd when he was the uh, Minister for Education uh, and if you have had some success in the sense that online uh, learning is available, there, there's obviously some problem somewhere about making this training ma mandatory mm -hmm. uh, and I, I suppose I do agree wholeheartedly that teachers do need to have these skills and this understanding in order to get the effectiveness, not only for the child who has autism, but indeed for all the other children uh, within the classroom. 
Can I maybe just ask the question around the mandatory... Um, uh, we don't have mandatory training in, in Northern Ireland. Do we have mandatory training in any other part of the UK or indeed in the Republic? No, I would say that the Republic of Ireland is, um, their autism statistics in that are not as clear as ours are, um, first of all, um, to be able to report on what they're doing down there. Um, we obviously have the Autism Act, which brought in Autism and I led that campaign back in 2011. And the reason why we have such clear statistics is because of the Autism Act and the autism strategy that came from that. But no, um, I, it's not mandatory down south. Um, England, we're supposed to bring it in um a year and a half ago and I think they're still waiting on that being brought in however they do invest quite a lot of money in the autism education training service over there um, and they don't have as high a prevalence rate as we do in Northern Ireland and um, for school age children coming through now whether that's because again their autism act is only for adults so they're not counting children so the prevalence could be the same as ours but we don't know because we don't have statistics but there's um at the minute is one in a hundred. They're, they're quoting as the amount of um, autistic people within England, whereas we're saying it's one in 24 school age children. Um, but yes, they have definitely, and it's been brought to the fore, the National Autistic Society has brought it to the fore over there at Westminster. And they were supposed to bring it in, I think about a year and a half, two years ago. Um, I don't think it has been brought in. I think there were issues with that as well. Don't know what happened there. But I know that they were definitely, they were ahead of us actually about bringing this in because they see, they see the need for it. The NHS over there as well has made it one of their top priorities for the next 10 years because, again, they see the prevalence rates and the need for support. Um, but, yes, it's something that I can look into again, what's happening in England. Okay. Um, autism and I is part of the Autism Alliance UK. So we meet with all of the Scottish, Welsh and English charities a couple of times a year. So it's something I can bring to them. Yeah. Robin, if I could just come in sh shortly. Uh, apologies that our time is so short today. That That's your, your five minutes. If you want to make a closing comment there, Robin, thank you. No, I, I would certainly like to follow up, Chair, uh, on your suggestion that we do write to the Minister and understand what the blockage has been over the years. Uh, and certainly if Autism NI can uh, report back to us on what the situation is in GB, uh, then I think it might be helpful to us to have an understanding of that, Chair. Thanks for that, Robin. Can I bring in Daniel McCrossan, MLA? Thanks. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to Autism uh, NIE for the presentation today and for sharing uh, their experiences uh, in terms of dealing with the Department of Ministers and also what they're sharing from what they're hearing from many families and uh, people out there. Um, you've you've uh, already said about the uh, the increase in numbers of children being diagnosed with uh, uh, autism each and every year. Um, we all recognise, and certainly we've said in this committee on many occasions, that there is a desperate need for autism training, and, and uh, I see that very clearly as a, an uncle of a, a six-year-old child with autism, and I can see uh, uh, exactly why it is needed. Uh, particularly if you look during COVID, it has shone a very bright spotlight on many of the issues uh, surrounding a lack of support for uh, young people with autism, people with autism generally. Um, so with that said, uh, will the training, in your opinion, help support other children and young people who may not be autistic but have other personal or learning needs? And secondly, uh, would you prioritise the groups of teachers that, that need to be trained? If so, what would that priority list look Christine, can you go ahead? Yes. Um, so the, the first question there around, um, you know, supporting other children that, that um, aren't diagnosed as autistic. Absolutely. Um, as I mentioned before, um, we talk about this a lot within training, that actually good autism practice is, is very, very good practice for a lot of children and young people. The um, strategies that we, that, that we talk about and that we explore within our training, um, especially uh, our training specifically for teaching staff, is really looking at a whole school approach. So it's 
um, promoting that integration um, across the school. So it's not about saying because this child is autistic, we have to do things very differently or teach them in a very different way. It's around looking at actually what strategies can be put into place that embed within the classroom and the whole classroom that can support that autistic child, but can also support many other children um, with a range of differences, with a range of uh, potential challenges um, and uh, with a range of um, experiences. Um, and as I said, that may be children where they have other conditions, so other hidden disabilities and hidden conditions or other uh, educational needs and learning needs. Um, or it could be children um, in the current situation who are being reintegrated back into school, highly anxious because of the current COVID situation um, and their experiences over the last year. So absolutely, we really envisage that not only with this training support, um, teachers to really empower and build on the strengths of those one in 24 children on the spectrum. Um, it will also be a really good practice approach for lots of children right across their school um, and right across their classroom. Um, the second part of, of your question um, really around um, teachers. Um, could you just kind of go through that again, just so that I'm, I'm definitely getting it right <laughs> for you? So basically what I'm asking is would you would you prioritize the groups okay. of teachers that need to be trained? Yeah, so um, I mean, we would really envisage that that would be a, a conversation and an exploration in terms of, of looking at what the Department of Education already have in terms of their um, evidence around what teachers have um, access training. We know that there are um, stati some statistics uh, available around how many teachers have been trained, as Kerry mentioned earlier. Um, we're not sure from an internal point of view within the department whether they have a, a, an access to who has been trained, who hasn't. Um, what we would see as a best practice approach is to actually engage with each school um, and engage with the Senko within the school to look at what teachers have been trained, what teachers haven't, um, and, and review that. But we envisage as well, as I mentioned, that the there should be refresher training available. So, you know, for some of the teachers who may have on paper access training uh, around autism, that, you know, may be 10 years ago. Um, so what we would really love to see is a, a really whole school approach um, and a consistent approach looking at uh, refresher training so that all teachers across the, the school um, are able to uh, discuss things uh, within the school and, and be able to practice, I suppose, that whole culture change within the school so that it's it's embedded within uh, the day-to-day -day processes. Okay, thank you. Should the ETA be trained? The ETA? ETA. ETA. Sorry, could you clarify uh, the ETA? The inspectors. Go, go ahead, Daniel. Go ahead, Daniel. School, school inspectors. Oh, um... Well, yes, absolutely. I mean, this, I suppose we have been focused very much on mandatory training for teachers um, and, and teaching staff, but we recognise that actually in a best practice approach, anyone involved in decisions around children's educational attainment and ch children's educational experiences um, should have an understanding of um, autism. Uh, if school inspectors are, are coming in and looking at those uh, processes, it's important and vital for them to have an understanding of why certain processes are being put into place um, and an understanding of the wider SEN process. Thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, just in terms of the that's, current situation. If you last question, Daniel, thanks. Yeah. The, the current situation we're faced with in terms of the pandemic, it has had a, a, a huge impact on families and children with uh, autism. How, how do you rate the effectiveness of the support being offered to autistic children and young people at the moment? Do you believe it's comprehensive enough? And are there inconsistencies in provision? And would you believe that if mandatory training was in place, would that have alleviated a lot of that pressure? I think certainly, certainly inconsistencies are are in place, um, and and were in place pre COVID. Um, we we see that through our uh, engagement with families, through our helpline, through training, through um, our support groups. We have some families who have really positive experiences um, and work really well with their school and their teacher uh, for their child, and then we have um, families who have extreme um, challenges right across um, their the educational experience for their child, and and that's something that 
that's happened before COVID, but certainly we've seen the same with COVID. Um, families who have been getting lots of support from some schools um, and other families who have felt really, really isolated and, and really um, disadvantaged because of the impacts. Um, so I, I think, I suppose, if, if I was to summarise it in any way, inconsistent um, is something that, that definitely comes up. And again, that's why we're so focused on providing mandatory support uh, because the inconsistency that we see across schools and education is is one of the the key factors that keeps being highlighted to us. Um, so if we if we can get this mandatory, we think that that will that will really push forward a consistent approach across Northern Ireland. Thanks, sure, uh, very, Thanks Daniel. Very 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 brief question. Very Australia. brief because we're really short for time for t- today, Daniel. Thanks. Go ahead. There, there's been a point raised about restraint and seclusion. Would your proposed training address this issue in any way? For example, would it provide alternative strategies and approaches to restraint and seclusion? Well, yes, I think uh, I think restraint and, and seclusion very much um, is is a strategy that should be avoided at all costs um, and it's, it's certainly in many cases seen as a, a crisis strategy when things are really going wrong. Um, what we would envisage is actually if there is a preventative proactive approach where teachers are confident and skilled in the use of a range of, of preventative and proactive approaches that uh, as Kerry said um, many of the situations that occur where, where restraint and seclusion are potentially used um, may not actually occur because we're able to support those children at a much earlier stage um, and address the concerns and the issues. Thanks for that. Can I bring Thank in you. Robbie Butler, MLA? Thanks, Daniel. Robbie? Thanks, Chair. Uh, is it, I'm in the spotlight yet? Yeah, I think I am. <laughs> okay, guys. Um, hi, uh, Carrie and Christine. Brilliant uh, presentation. Just like uh, the Chair had to do, I'll uh, declare my interest. Obviously, I'm a member of the Autism All Party Group and was involved um, when we went and visited Middletown a number of years ago, which seems like an awfully long time ago. Um, And we had a fantastic presentation when we were there, and that obviously helped to, uh, I suppose, give the energy and the detail to the motion that came forward and the the, the old party uh, methodology in terms of tackling this. So um, it is is slightly disappointing to think we're going to get there. It's slightly disappointing we haven't quite quite cracked that, not just yet in terms of the numbers, Gary, in particular. Um, But... Can I ask then, given the role that classroom assistants uh, particularly play and very much in the in the one-to-one scenarios and so on, how important would it be that it's not just teachers but classroom assistants uh, are picked up in, in, in the mandatory training as well? Well, it's actually for all teaching staff. Sorry, I should have made that clear. It starts for all teaching staff throughout Northern Ireland. And I know that they aren't so to speak, um, teachers. They're not teaching the child, but they're working with the child. So absolutely, they need to be trained up as well. And and we know, um, I very naively, whenever I first started work with autism and I years and years ago, very naively thought that the classroom assistants were, you know, if they're working with a child with autism, they would be trained up because they're working one-on-one, but that's not the case. Yes. Many of them do not have any autism training. And to me, that's absolutely ludicrous because they're there to support that autistic child. So yes, it would be definitely, it would be a obviously classroom assistants and, and teachers. However, we know the classroom assistants are not there to teach the child. It has to be the teachers. The teacher needs to be trained up to. Um, but it's, it's bigger than that. As Christina said, you know, it's a full culture change you want. You know, teachers are stressed. We know this. And that's what I said at the start of this. We do know that they have a lot of stresses and um, not being able to understand or communicate adequately with the child with autism would be very stressful. So this is about supporting the teachers as well as the classroom assistants and also bringing about a culture change um, of positivity. Like these children are going to be our future. You know, it's one in 24, one in 16 boys we're talking about are going to be the future of Northern Ireland. And if you look at the employment rate, 22%, only 22% are in full-time or part-time employment. That shows you where this is going. And this is why it needs to change. It needs to change in the classroom. This is where a child spends the majority of their day. Well, that, that's the bit, that's the bit, that's the bit that I want to carry, if you don't mind. You're literally taking it into the territory for my second question. I mean, we, as public servants and I'm looking after the, the, the public sector and so on in terms of value for money, this is really important that we understand what this is about. So part of it is about that quality of teaching and, and ensuring that their, their education can be as good as it, it, that it possibly can. However, there, the, the outcomes for this... I know that you guys have some, done some work into what those outcomes are. So you're talking about the employability. And so could, in terms of anybody that is watching or listening into this, that this goes beyond the learning piece, could you outline what, what the tangible outcomes are 
hope to be, if you like, in terms of those uh, um, long, you know, the, the life outcomes for, for, for young yeah. people with autism. It, yeah, it's it's more about, you know, it's, uh, to me, it's an absolute travesty that only 22% of autistic adults are in any type of employment. That's less than half of dis disability average, okay? And we know that those adults are very capable of working within an environment. That environment needs to be adapted for them, okay? It does need to be, and um, people need to understand what autism is and be aware of it as well within the workplace. And we know that's not happening, and that's why we feel that very basically from a child, from the child right through to adult, it's a lifelong condition. It doesn't change. You know, it's it's not cured. So this is going to go throughout an adult's life as well. And for us to know that all of these adults are sitting in the home possibly, um, and a lot of them have mental health issues. You know, there's, there's very dire statistics. I don't really want to go into them now, but there's very poor statistics of mental health and all with autism and how that and life, life expectancy and things like that because of that. Um, and to me, it's a bigger thing. It's a cultural change that needs to start from the child within the classroom and with their other classmates as well need to better understand if the teacher doesn't like what does, you know, you know yourself when you're a child, you listen to everything the teacher says and how they behave and how they react. If they're reacting badly, so to speak, or not understand a child with autism, how do you expect other children within the classroom to understand? It's about getting that right then and there. And I feel that, that will happen if we help those teachers and classroom assistants better understand. Okay. Thanks, this, Robert. This will be my final question. It's actually two. Thanks, Robert. Because I know it'll be tight for time here. So this is about the specific training that we're talking about at the moment. So the, the first part of the question is, do you believe that the training package that's available at the moment is appropriate, that, that it, it covers the things that need to be covered? Um, you talked about it being online. Is, is that the case? Um, and the second question is more provocative to you guys because you guys are the, specialised in autism. I'm the chair of the uh, all-party group on ADHD, as you'll know as well. And there are other um, needs that children have that, and that there are obviously... Um, uh, as you've said, you know, mental health doesn't, you know, doesn't stop at the border of having autism or the ADHD or others, any other special education need. Can, are we being ambitious enough? And should the package eventually be something that's more encompassing and, and more inclusive of, of other um, uh, learning difficulties and, and disabilities? Um, well, yes, in terms of, of the training, again, we, Autism and I, provide um, our own training packages and things, so I could talk, I suppose, more um, specifically on those. But in, in regards to the, the training currently provided uh, by uh, the Education Authority or, or by the Department of Education, um, I think... It's, it's really about, um, or what we would like to see is, is a complete review really of what is provided. Because again, there's a lot of different elements that are provided. There's a lot of different options that are provided, but, um, you know, a consistent approach as to what autism training means. You know, for some teachers, they, they have access training that is one hour, two hours long. For some, it will be a much more comprehensive approach. And the key things that we would say in terms of improving um, the training and, and ensuring that it is across the board fit for purpose is the fact that it would be live and interactive and um, so if there are training modules that we um that we have heard of that are um either you read them for yourself or it's pre-recorded we feel that that's not um a, you know really a, an appropriate uh the type of training because for teachers they need to be able to engage they need to be able to interact ask questions and be given the space and time to be able to actually um, really understand what that information is and how they can embed that within their processes. So um, we think very much that any training should be delivered. Um, it should be consistent. It should be delivered interactively so that there is um, time and space for discussion. Um, and again, then it should be um, consistent across Northern Ireland. So that, you know, when a parent asks if their, their child's teacher has been trained, that when they get the answer, yes, um, that they know what that means. They know the level of training that has been provided. Um, and that they're they're confident in that and confident about how they can work with the teacher to um, okay. support their child. Um, the second part um, of your question in terms of, of inclusivity, what we would really see as well in, in a lot of our training, um, what we really focus on within our training is um, ensuring that we are being inclusive, ensuring that we are promoting and, and recognizing diversity as a positive thing. Um, and that, again, we are promoting good practice approaches, um, that good autism practice really supports a lot of children across um, a range of different needs and a range of different, um, you know, either learning 
learning needs, educational needs, or um, other anxieties or, or mental health conditions. Um, so we very much see that actually, if we get this right for autistic children, where we know that there are one in 24 um, children in the classroom, it will create a, br- a blueprint for looking at actually what elements of training, what supports um, can be embedded within the classroom to support wider than the autistic population. <coughs> Okay. Thanks for that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Robbie. Thank you. Can I bring in William Humphrey, MLA? Thanks. Um, morning, Carrie. Morning, Christine. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation and for the very valuable work you do. It's hugely, hugely important. Um, I suppose at the start, I'd like to just pay tribute. I don't know whether you're aware of a group in my area that I helped establish called Snowflakes. It does tremendous work. A lady called Ashley Spence and her team do great work with young people from across Belfast indeed further afield. And also for the clear interest, I'm president of Northwest Belfast Scout Council. And in 2018, we re-established, uh, re-established one of our old scout groups. Uh, and th- the young people in that group were specifically focusing on young people and children with um, autism and their families. And uh, we've established a compact there. And Ashley is actually the group scout leader there. So uh, I want to pay tribute to the to the people in our community across Northern Ireland who are, who are working with young people with autism and their families. It's hugely important work. Uh, moving to questions, um, Carrie, you mentioned twenty two percent of of adults with autism being in employment. I think that was the figure you mentioned. Um, obviously, that's a, a worry and a, and a concern. Um, w- because you mentioned employment, and others obviously have been talking about um, education and training and so on. Do you think there's a sufficiency in joined upness across government around these issues? I obviously, um, we're talking about education here today because we're at the Education Committee, but employment is obviously another government department. Do you think there is that joined upness or can more be done? No, I don't think there is. And I think it's all stemmed from the autism strategy at the minute. Um, there's an interim one obviously out at the minute, but even the previous one, um, again, I know this is more for the health committee, but the autism strategy, and um, there's three action plans attached to that. Only one of them were com- completed. <clears throat> within the time frame. So we've now got an interim autism strategy and the Department of Health is obviously the lead department on that and they should be ensuring that all departments are working together and there is this, um, you know, consistency across um, from child through to adults. But we don't feel, as a charity, we we, we know there's not. Um, And it is really critical because this is what's going to happen. If we don't turn the curve at the start, those children are going to end up another statistic within that 22% later on. And we know that mental health, um, you're eight times more likely to have mental health um, issues if you are an adult with autism than if you're a neurotypical, so to speak. We know all of this, but we do feel that if they're given the right support at the start, early intervention, as well as work within the schools, that this will not happen. But they do definitely need to be um, more joined up, need to be working with employment agencies and that to get adults with autism into workplaces. Um, we do know that there are some places such as Specialist Stern and that that do do that. Autism and I have their own impact award where we work with employers as well to make the work- workplace more autism friendly, so to speak. Um, but yes, it, it is vital. But there's so much um, there's so much that needs to be done because the prevalence rates are so high and there's so little that has been done, should I say, as well. Um, so far, uh, that I think the best place to start is definitely where a child is spending the majority of their day in that environment and that culture change there. So hopefully it will go throughout their life. But yes, different departments within the executive need to be working together on this. Um, it can't just be left to the Department of Health to do it. Okay. Um, can I just turn, turn then to teacher training? And I, I want to commend those teachers who give up their own time uh, and give up from their own pockets in terms of their training. Um, something which obviously needs to be addressed. Yeah. Um, is the situation improving in terms of teacher training? Uh, I mean, for example, in the last few years, have we seen an advance? And if not, how can we speed it up? Well, think- as obviously... Go ahead, Christine. Sorry. Go ahead. Um- I was going to say, I think it's very hard to to really look at progress, um, you know, in terms of uh, announcements and in terms of, um, 
you know, what we see on the ground. Uh, we recognize that there have been announcements even quite recently around new modules of training being available and those being available online for, for teachers. Um, what we see, I suppose, on the ground is we're looking at those outcomes for families and we see again and again that there are families that aren't seeing those outcomes on the ground for their child. Um, and we recognize that there is really good practice out there within schools. There's really good practice with teachers. Um, and there is uh, there are some resources available for, for schools and for teachers. And it's not really about saying that that those should be absolutely kind of done away with and we, we start again. It's really about uh, tweaking and adapting and, and really promoting a best practice approach. Um, you know, for, for a lot of those resources, what we're seeing is very clearly from the statistics and the research that Kerry reviewed at, at the very start of our session, um, it's, it's not going far enough to support families and to support children. There are huge gaps and that there are huge uh, issues that are still uh, needing to be addressed. So I think, um, you know, from the from the outcomes that we're seeing or the, the lack of outcomes for some families, there there is a real clear need um, to address and to support uh, teachers and um, the, the education experience um, and improve that for autistic individuals. Sure, I'll, I'll leave it there, but I do think others talked earlier about letters to the minister so it's very clear as the session has gone on i think it's uh, letters to a number of ministers and i think perhaps the committee liaising with uh, with um, carrie and christine and their organization we might actually be able to find a focus letter to go to the relevant ministers to try and push forward that joined upness that's clearly not there at the moment thank you both very much thank you fair fair point william we'll we'll come back to that uh, can i bring in nicola brogan mla please Thank you, Chair, and thanks, Kerry and Christine, for your um, briefing this morning. Um, I think you can tell now you've got the full support of the committee, and you definitely have my support. Um, I agree, obviously, in the mandate that we need mandatory training for teachers and teaching staff. Um, and I definitely agree with you that it's much about supporting teachers as it is about pupils with autism and other pupils in the classroom. Um, as a few members have already alluded to, we had a briefing from um, families of children who suffered restraint and seclusion from incidents of that there. And I've separately met with parents um, of children with different special educational needs, um, autism included. And to kind of outline the struggles they've had, this, I had a meeting with um, a range of parents um, just back in March time. And it's really harrowing hearing their stories and how much support they need and how they don't receive it and how they feel let down. Um, and in fact, Christine, I don't think anyone's picked up on this, but the case study you um, made today, like I, I just think that's so shocking and really, really sad that a child has now had to leave his school, um, their school, I'm not sure it was a boy girl, um, and be homeschooled because the support isn't there in 2021 in the north. And that simply isn't good enough. It's, um, you know, I think you're making the right steps and it's just, it is shocking and to say very, very sad that those children will be left like that. Um, I want to pick up on one question Robbie had raised um, about all teaching staff getting access to the training. Um, at the moment, the online training, are classroom assistants and other staff, um, do they have access to that or is it just teachers? Um, as, as far as we're aware, um, the, the training that's available is, um, well, what we've what was announced really is that it is available as and when um, it is identified within um, uh, an individual's professional development needs. Um, so I suppose from from our point of view, what that really means on the ground, um, you know, is something that, that we would really um, question or, or that we would really be concerned around, um, whether that includes teachers as well as classroom assistants, whether there is... Um, um, you know, capacity within um, those professional development meetings and professional development uh, plans for uh, teachers and classroom assistants to be able to be afforded the time and the resources to do that. Uh, we know from, you know, engaging with, with teachers and classroom assistants that there are um, times where, as, as we mentioned before, they're coming on board to do things on Saturday mornings or in the summertime when they're off um, because actually they have 
quite clearly identified that they would like that to support them in their role. But for whatever reason, whether it be around, um, you know, time, resources, we know that a big issue is uh, a lot of teachers would say to me that they, you know, they can't get the cover organized to be able to be uh, allowed to go out to training and things like that. Um, so we know that there are there are challenges around the practicalities of accessing those things, um, both for teachers and classroom assistants. Um, and, and personally, I know a few classroom assistants who, um, you know, they are one to one classroom assistants for children on the spectrum um, and they've never been given any sort of formal autism training um, and they've come on board um, to, to access that in their own time and, and trying to um you know, I suppose empower themselves, but not feeling supported um, yeah. from, from their employer to be able to do that. Yeah, and that's great. And it's great for them. And it's great for those teachers that have um, taken the onus upon themselves to do that. But I suppose that's part of this whole mandatory training to make it easier for them to get the time dedicated to them. Um, uh, absolutely. The other top point I want to raise, Pat has already raised it about um, engagement with unions back when the motion was passed in February 2020. Um, I think there was some discussion about engagement with teacher training colleges as well. Um, have you engaged with them since the motion has passed um, or how has that been left? Um, I think it was the Minister um, for Education that was going to engage with the teacher training colleges um, about ensuring that it was within, um, and I think it was actually Chris that maybe suggested this, that it was within, or it could have been Robbie, I'm not sure, within the all-party group autism, that it should be um, within, obviously, their, at the start, teacher training, because at the minute, correct me if I'm wrong, Christine, um, they're doing, well, but prior to this, they were doing a module on SEM, on special educational needs and it was more a generic module it's not right with autism within it so what we're saying is that it would be good obviously to start off with um you know right where the teachers you know from teacher training onwards where they're getting that um autism specific training then and there however that is that is exactly what needs to be done but it's teachers that are in the roles as well need to, obviously it needs to because by the time they filter through you could be waiting 10 or 20 years because everyone knows teachers are perhaps in their role for maybe 20 or 30 years um so we really need to um start there as well but it needs to be obviously existing teachers too but no we haven't specifically been speaking to the colleges um autism and i hasn't anyway but i know the minister for education was going to work with them i thought that's what he said within the um the debate in the chamber back in february um, yeah. it's all right just to, to follow on from that a good practice approach is doing both uh, looking at both the new teachers coming through and then looking at mm -hmm. the, the existing teachers within schools yeah and to make sure it's a rolling kind of thing just a final point on that yeah. is there any kind of um compulsory like cpd hours for teachers on autism specifically at the minute probably not if it's not mandatory yeah. if there's no mandatory training yeah, not as far as we're aware. As far as we're aware from the announcements and the information that we can that we can gain, it is um, it seems to be very much focused on uh, the board of governors uh, deciding from school to school and um, within individual teachers' uh, personal development plans and professional development plans. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Nicola. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Can I bring in Justin McNulty, MLA? Thanks. Hi, Kerry. Hi, Christine. Um, Autism NA are very lucky to have such determined people at the head of the organisation. Um, so, listen, thank you very much for your evidence today. Um, I'm very proud, guys. I'm very proud that my SDLP predecessor, Don McBrady, mm -hmm. led the delivery of the Autism Bill in 2011. And he was very um, grateful for the support provided by one of your predecessors, I believe, Arlene Cassidy. Um, and so, that's a fantastic achievement. But it's a shame that some of the ambitions of that bill haven't been delivered on, especially in terms of the strategy. The strategy is there, but it's not been followed through. Um, and it's, it appears that the, the then health minister was initially opposed to that bill, and it now appears that the education minister is, is opposed to the mandatory training. In terms of the mandatory training, can you tell me um, what relationship do you have with uh, Middletown and what potential role could they play the Middletown Centre for Autism, and what potential role could they play in the delivery of that mandatory training? Well, we've also, obviously, Middletown um, has been around for the past number of years, and they are the um, 
to so called themselves the Centre for Excellence for Autism in Northern Ireland. Autism and I has provided um, training for over 20 years as well. We're an accredited, accredited training provider and we're the experts also. However, I think that you have the resource there to deliver this and I think the resource is Middletown. I think they can do it. Um, they have the expertise there, a lot of expertise. Um, I just think, as Christine says, it needs to be organised in a way that we are providing this um, consistent training across the board. And I do think they're a massive resource. There's a lot of money pumped into middle time, as you know. And I think that they could do this training. And I think actually um, the other thing is with the pandemic, um, I know it's not ideal even what we're doing today, virtually meeting. But I think it's given a lot of businesses and organisations an, an opportunity. And I think this is the way they could be training up teachers as long as it's interactive and as long as it is mandatory, I think you could nearly do it virtually. Because I know one of the issues that the um, the uh, um, the teachers unions have said was, you know, there's no time, this is extra workload, blah, blah, blah. You know, but if you're doing it virtually, that cuts down on a lot of that. Um, but I do think middle time, we, you know, Christian will say, their training is fantastic. There's no issue with the training. It just needs to be that um, awareness level training um, they seem to come in at, at a different level. I've seen it like, really much further, like a second level where it's basically a crisis, where school's a crisis, middle town then intervenes. Whereas we want this basic level training before it gets to that stage. Okay. Um, Christine, do you want to... Yeah, so we, we have met with Middletown uh, before and, and in them explaining some of their supports, um, you know, they do a lot of what they see as as, uh, as level two supports. So that would be, you know, looking at a whole school approach. Uh, we know that they do really fantastic work when, when a particular child is having significant challenges and really when it reaches crisis point, they can go in and work specifically and individually with that child to, to support either the whole school or within uh, a particular classroom um, supporting that child. But again, we recognise that actually there probably are children and young people going through that crisis support using Middletown, um, where actually if the support was earlier and more proactive and put into place, um, the teachers may not have had to um, implement that, that more crisis level support. Um, so, you know, we really see very much, as I mentioned earlier, it's not about creating an absolutely brand new and um, expensive kind of service and support. It's really about readjusting and, and re-evaluating what is available and, and maybe changing and adapting that to make sure that the key points of it being consistent uh, and mandatory across Northern Ireland and it really affecting change uh, for those teachers and empowering those teachers to independently uh, support and that's school to independently support children rather than having to rely on external agencies all the time and having to rely on things getting really, really bad and really, really tough before uh, that child is given any any level of support. Um, we see you know that as being a really good practice approach and a really, um, I suppose, the first thing that needs to be done in, in terms of this when we make it mandatory, uh, really reviewing that, how do we uh, put this into place and make it effective and e efficient using the resources that are in part already there. Okay, thank you. I was, I was appalled to hear a story uh, recently about, um, actually last week, about a young pupil in a school in Belfast who had high functioning ADSD, high ability autism, um, where he was being scapegoated and picked upon in the class and he was being made to use a, um, a staged hand to put his hand up to ask the teacher a question because he was way ahead of the teacher even in terms of his, his knowledge, his ability. And that was that was uh, seen as something to be um, attacked almost. Um, and so it may be very sad that could be the case that some people who have autism are being held back. And, and this goes right across the spectrum. They're being held back. I see autism as, as, as being a gift, being something special, and should be celebrated almost. Um, but so why why you know given that delivery of the bill in 2011, why has there not been teacher training to accommodate? autism, which is obviously so prevalent in our society. Why is it not mandatory within the teaching training uh, colleges now for to, to arm teachers with the, the tools to be able to help these children? Oh, uh, well, I think, um, you know, there, as we said, there there are pockets of training and there are supports and, and training available. But um, as, as you quite rightly say, we, we do hear stories all the time, um, either in the media um, or, you know, we, we hear a lot um, through our services and our supports that it's just not going far enough. There are still very, very clear issues. Um, and 
you know, that to us speaks volumes in terms of using an outcomes based approach that we need to be looking at those those stories. We need to be looking at the outcomes for children. We need to be looking at those statistics for transition issues, for employment, uh, for mental health and saying, actually, we're, we're still not doing enough. Something is not working right. Um, and, you know, for us, it does seem like a very um, straightforward approach and a very common sense approach that actually we look at it being mandatory. We look at it being more consistent and, and being as interactive as possible. Um, you know, I suppose for us, it is we, we have talked about this for a long time and, and that we have been campaigning and debating this for a long time. And there does seem to be quite a lot of support in general around, um, you know, the, the evidence and the statistics and, and people saying, OK, well, yeah, this, this really makes sense. Um, and for us, what's, what's concerning is the longer it takes to implement this, the more um, children are really struggling and continuing to struggle and continuing to be taken out of school and, and uh, not being afforded the same opportunities um, and, and equal opportunities uh, because of their disability. Okay. Thanks for that. Okay, yeah. Justin. Just very finally, what's your number one ask of us as committee? Obviously, we're all very supportive of, of what you're proposing, um, ladies. What, what's your number ask of us as a committee? Um, basically, to um, ask the Minister for Education to um, implement what was promised a wee year ago that it has to be mandatory. I think if we don't do it mandatory, we're no better off than we were 10 years ago, where people are choosing to do, teachers are choosing to do autism training or not. And this, again, I, this is not about the teachers, but this is what's happening. So it has to be mandatory and it has to be interactive, the training. It has. It can't be like whenever we did that petition, over 10,000 people signed it. And all of the parents says, we don't want a tick box exercise. And all of them said it has to be mandatory and they understand, you know, this is where a child spends the majority of their day. So for it to be mandatory and for it to be interactive. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, Lee. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. And uh, finally, Morris Bradley, MLA. Can you hear me, Chair? Can yes, Morris, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Morris, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Chair. And thanks very much for the presentation this morning, ladies. Uh, I believe that mandatory training is vital and I'd agree, I would agree that this committee should write seeking clarity on where we presently are and identify what the drawbacks are to actually having uh, mandatory training. Uh, and I think it was William uh, alluded to it. We also need to identify and write to uh, any ministers and departments necessary, I think, to have a joined up approach to ensure that people suffering from autism, uh, that they can be given every opportunity to be the very best that they can be. Uh, not just in education, but also in employment opportunities. So it was a bit disappointed to learn how, how few people suffering from autism are actually in employment. Uh, I think that that's, has to be addressed. But can I ask what the benefits uh, could be delivered from a mandatory training to teachers working with children who are also dealing with a, a classroom setting and a classroom full of other pupils who may struggle to understand or deal with a fellow class member suffering from autism? Uh, and given the wide... The wide uh, spectrum of autism. By training classroom assistants, could this training also be a benefit to teachers by having that extra set of hands available in a classroom setting to ensure the development of any people that, who may be suffering from, from autism? Yeah, so I think in terms of the training, we, we see training very much as as I suppose as a primary aim, supporting and empowering teachers and teaching staff um, and classroom assistants to be able to um, understand their pupils in the best way, to recognise where the strengths of those pupils are and where potential challenges uh, may arise and supporting them with those those things and really um, empowering the child to be the best that they can be and attain the best education. Um, but wider than that as well, we see it very much, as we said, as a whole school approach. Um, we know that there are lots of of challenges with peer understanding of autism as well. Um, and we've engaged with schools and teachers before where there is a worry or a concern around um, engaging peers with understanding about inclusion and diversity in autism because the teachers themselves aren't feeling confident about talking about autism. So how can they really promote a, a really positive and inclusive approach to their peers? So we very much see it as a whole school approach, that culture change um, that includes peers and includes uh, you know the whole school 
and the whole classroom. Uh, we see that, you know, a lot of the strategies that we um, embed within training and that we really promote to teachers will support the teachers to do their job in the best way possible, will support uh, the whole classroom to function effectively and function together as a unit, and most importantly, support that autistic child to uh, to have the best educational experience. So again, we see it as, as that real wider approach, as you say, to, to support everybody and all the stakeholders involved. Um, so, you know, we think that's a really important part. And again, the, the, the idea of making it mandatory will really help rather than there just being one teacher who's been trained in autism. Um, you know, it's, it's really about that whole culture change that the whole school is, is aware and understands and, and is positive of diversity and um, inclusion for autistic children and, and a range of children. Um, so we, we feel that's really important. Um, with the classroom assistance, we, as we said, we absolutely think it should be both teaching staff and classroom assistants should understand anybody who is supporting that child to attain education and have a positive educational experience should understand autism, should recognize um, the strengths of autistic individuals and should support them to be able to make the most of their educational experience. Um, and, and that goes for classroom assistants and teachers we know that for a lot of people they don't necessarily have classroom assistants as well um, so that's why we think it's so important for uh, teaching staff as well to to have this training not just for the children who are at stage five of special educational needs where they have a one-to-one -one classroom assistant and um, this goes right across the board for all one in 24 children um, who uh, who are autistic uh, within our schools yeah thank you okay yeah, Chair, just a wee comment, and I think the, the uh, Kerry and Christine both get the feeling that the entire committee is behind them in this here, and I, and I wish them well, and we'll see what you can do as Chair. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, thanks, Morris. I think that's a good summary uh, to conclude on, Morris. Um, Kerry, Christine, thank you so much for your presentations today, and as all members have said, for the advocacy that uh, you do on behalf of children with autism. We'll agree the actions that we've suggested today and we'll keep you up to date as to the responses we receive. Thanks so much. Thanks, Chris. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay. You. If uh, Assembly Broadcasting could uh, remove our witnesses and bring members back into the spotlight. And Clark, if you could uh, summarise the actions for us. Sure. Um, Chair, the uh, committee will want to write to the Education Minister primarily, um, first of all, to ask um, about the rollout of mandatory autism training to all teaching staff to empower them um, uh, to deal with this like, big category of pupils um, and uh, to ask why uh, it hasn't been done before, given that the campaign has been represented to and favourably received by successive ministers over a long period of time. Um, and there's a lot of uh, detail, obviously, behind that, but also then the committee um, wanted to uh, write to the minister to reflect um, that, you know, this exemplar um, context that we want to create in schools will need to follow through then to the workplace. And also the committee wanted to write to the health minister about the implementation of the autism strategy action plans, um, which are lagging. Um, is that, is that enough for the moment? Yes. Yeah. Members agreed. Chair, Chair, could I maybe just um, add? Yeah. Yeah, can I just add to that? I, I agree with the summary of the committee clerk there, but can I just pick up on Justin's comment that he said that the minister was opposed to mandatory training? I think that is, is not correct, uh, Justin. But, Chair, when I, when I asked the question about the um, number of teachers, uh, sorry, when I asked the question about to training in GB, um, if, if we could make sure that indeed uh, autism and I do come back with that information, I think that would be important. But could we also follow up uh, with uh, Strand Mullis and St Mary's and see exactly what the uh, number of units are that have been taken either online or whether or not within the teachers continuing professional development, uh, there, are, uh, uh, there are opportunities for, for teachers within that CDP to, to pick up on autism strategy. And if we can sort of quantify the situation, Chair, so it gives us something as a springboard, perhaps for the future. Okay. Thanks, Robin. Sure. Can you go back on that? 
Yeah, cool. briefly, just <laughs> very quickly. Rob, there was, I said, it appears he's opposed to it based on the fact that his letter says that there are, are options open for training and all this, but there's no uh, recommendation for manager training. So I said it appears so. So, okay, point made, Rob, point made, Justin. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You've, you've defended his honor, Robin. Well done. Okay, uh, Here, Clark, uh, briefly, briefly, come in, briefly, Daniel, please. Thanks. Yep, yeah. Uh, Chair, there's quite a lot of people watching today's committee session because this is a very important issue, uh, and you'll know that in your role as chair of the autism group at Stormont. Uh, but I just received a message, Daniel. I'm asking you: Can you bring up the use of language in this committee meeting? I've just listened to unquote suffering from autism phrase five times in the last thirty seconds, and it's nearly made me burst into tears of frustration. Can you remind members? Uh, about their language, so I'm just that's that's people are listening, folks. So we just have yeah. to be very careful about our use of phrase. Th thanks for that, Daniel. So, a couple of quick points. Um, Pam Cameron is chair of the All Party Group on Autism, um, doing good work there. And yeah, fair fair um, feedback there in relation to the importance of language use. Again, uh, a point has been made. So thank you. Okay, uh, Clark, uh, content with those actions? Yes, indeed. Okay, thank, thank you, members. Uh, move us on to agenda item six then um, and ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove members from the spotlight and to add our witnesses, um, who I'm delighted to say are from the Northern Ireland uh, Commissioner for Children and Young People's Office. Can I refer members to a briefing paper from Nikki at page 48 and an Assembly Research briefing paper, Children's Rights and Education policy in Northern Ireland, the implementation of the UNCRC at page 55. And can I give a, a very warm welcome to uh, Kula Yasuma, the Northern Ireland Commissioner for Children and Young People, Maria McCafferty, Chief Executive. Are members hearing me okay? For some reason I'm not working. Am I, I can hear you, Kula. Um, am I clear? I was echoing a bit there. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. You can. Is there feedback? Yeah. Maybe if if witnesses could just mute themselves before I bring in, that'd be that'd be great. Hopefully that'll rectify that echo. But yeah, if I could just continue, I'm still echoing, Clark. Am I? Yeah. No, I'll just ask broadcasting for you if there's nothing you can do, Chair. Okay. Well. Can, is that better? Can you hear me? Clark, can you hear me okay? Yes? Okay. So I'll just continue to welcome Maria McCafferty, the Chief Executive of the Northern Ireland Commissioner for Children and Young People's Office, uh, Senior Neve Devlin, Senior Policy and Research Officer, Christine Irvine, Policy and Research Officer. You're all very welcome this morning. Um, we're delighted to have this time with you. And I'll hand over to the Children's Commissioner for opening remarks. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair. There seems, oh, there's a lot of echo. There seems to be a bit of uh, But if you can hear me, I'll, I'll go ahead. I, yes, I, I'm experiencing that echo as well, uh, Kula. Um, let me sure. just ask the clerk if Assembly Broadcasting can do anything about that because I want to make sure you're you're clear and good quality. Clark, <laughs> any feedback from Assembly <laughs> Broadcasting? Me <laughs> too. I know. <laughs> They've just said that all of the feedback is coming from Kula, actually. Um, so right, I'm, just... I'm going to go out and come back. Will I do that? Okay. Yeah, okay. try that, Kula. Thank you. And um, they're they're trying to think of some other advice for us as well. So I'm just waiting for that. Okay. Okay. No problem. Maria, Neve, Christine, you're very welcome. Glad to have you with us this morning. We'll get. We'll get. We'll get here, Chris. Thank you. We'll get the boss back in as soon as yes, possible. Yes, we'll get. We'll get her in. <laughs> <laughs> And we, Clark, just to double check, we, we have to uh, shortly before 12 o'clock today, isn't that right? Yes. 12 o'clock is our yeah. cutoff. Okay. Um, okay, so broadcasting are happy to just see um, 
I could less signs when she comes back. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. And I'm just checking the spotlight, so she's not back in just yet. She's in the audience, so we're moving. She's moved up. There we to go. The right, there we go. Okay. There we go. Commissioner. Chair, thank you so much. Apologies. No um, even in, even in Bangor County Down, we have IT difficulties. <laughs> That's so sorted. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so thank you for your welcome. And, I, and before we launch, and, and <clears throat> we're really looking forward to the to the discussion, uh, I and the team, I just want to give a quick overview of where we're at and, and, and some of the issues that we want to highlight with you. And, and uh, you've already introduced the team, so I'll, I'll just move straight in. Um, just to say that Nikki um, close, continue to closely monitor and advise on the impact of the pandemic on children and young people. And what we have seen during the last year is um, a clear evidence that the pandemic and closure of schools has brought into sharp relief the fragility of the lives of children and their families. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> particularly those living in poverty and those um, uh, with additional needs. And, and you, you, your, your previous uh, from Autism and I highlighted a lot of that. I do want to say, though, at the beginning, the quick response of the Department of Education to replace free school meals with direct payments is to be applauded, as is the provision of additional devices and a free Wi-Fi scheme for those who need it. But there remain concerns about the relatively slow allocation of devices and the impact on education and well-being of children who have been without a device for much of the lockdown and therefore largely have been able to, uh, uh, to properly engage with home learning. Of particular concern is the impact of the pandemic on children with special educational needs and disability. Despite the fact that at the start of this most recent lockdown at Christmas, the minister issued a directive requiring all special schools to remain, to remain open for, for all of the 6,000 children, young people. A number of schools were only able to offer part-time provision. It's critical that the relevant authorities reflect on their actions during the last few months and their behaviours during this time and learn from it. So we've, we've seen that the playing field has become more unlevel than it was ever before. And many young people, um, for, for too many young people, and additional measures must be put in place to support them. This could include, but it's not limited to, the additional supports to be provided to children through the Engage programme, which I know you, you, you've talked a lot about. Moving on, the, it's evident that the COVID-19 pandemic has had a significant impact on the mental health and well-being of our children and young people. And I applaud, again, um, uh, formally add my congratulations and, and applaud the committee for the magnificent evidence session with young people from across a range of organisations, including our youth panel. It was, it, it was um, one of the highlights, I think, of the, uh, of the career of this assembly. The closure of schools, academic uncertainty, children having less contact with their peer group and the disruption of routine, together with concern about the virus, are all likely um, to create or have exacerb exacerbated ex existing mental health problems amongst our young people. It's really important to note that there's not a common experience for children and young people, not for, their ha not for how they've experienced the lockdown and school closures, nor how they feel about reopening and restarting of education. Therefore, there cannot be one response or set of expectations to reopening, but a pause to see how our young people are, how they are coping, and an ability to respond accordingly. However, and it's a big, big however, my office has received a significant number of reports of the pressures being placed on young people, particularly those in exam years, and the associated stress and anxiety generated by exam-like continuous assessment so soon after reopening. For too many of our young people, the rhetoric of well-being has been abandoned for the stress of academic testing. There appears to be, in some schools, an undue focus on assessment at the cost of well-being and education recovery. And it's important to note that this is not only for GCSE, AS and A-level students, but also in some cases for Year 12 pupils who, amidst, who are being tested amidst the continued uncertainty regarding the transfer test. 
There have been, just again, moving more, more, more broadly to mental health, there have been a significant um, policy and strategic de strategy developments over the last year, which have focused on children and young people's mental health and emotional well-being, including the, the pending mental health strategy, the mental health action plan that the Minister for Health published um, uh, 10 months ago, and of course, the emotional health and well-being in education framework, which all identify a range of supports and interventions within an education setting. The need for an adequately resourced plan for all educational settings which focus on, um, on building emotional well-being, good mental health of our children, young people and staff was necessary before, the com before COVID and is even more important now. However, it doesn't exist in a silo and therefore, uh, and therefore other parts of the system must all be sufficiently resourced and integrated. And we in NICI should be carefully monitoring their rollout and effectiveness. Words, words are great, but actions are far more important. And this will go alongside our monitoring and implementation of, of the still waiting report that we published in September 2018. In a couple of months, um, my office will publish what we hope will be a comprehensive, uh, as comprehensive as we can make it within the resources available, report on the impact of the pandemic on our young people, and we'll be making recommendations as to the way forward. Moving more broadly onto some of the, the broader education issues, the provision of appropriate, effective and timely support for children and young people with special educational needs and disability is a critical issue for my office. And the committee will, of course, be aware that we issued too little too late last March. We continue to work closely with the relevant authorities to ensure that the recommendations from, from too little too late are actioned and outcomes improved for children and young people. We're encouraged by the establishment of a DE SEN governance group and the action to date by the SEN D Strategic Development Programme Board. And we look forward to getting into more detail with the committee on the new SEN framework at a later date and understand we're looking at dates for, for May or June. Again, moving on more broadly to um, educational inequalities and inclusion. As I've already said, there are marked inequalities in Northern Ireland with regard to educational outcome, particularly when we consider that the aim of education should be about the development of a child's talents, personalities and abilities. Educational inequalities can only be addressed through significant transformation of the system in Northern Ireland, and we are encouraged by the prog progressing of the commitments made in New Decade New Approach, and stress that the independent review must be founded on children's rights and best interests and must be inclusive of the experiences and views of children, young people, their parents and carers. I'm now just going to very quickly talk about three issues, one of which has already um, you've already discussed here. Firstly, relationship and sexuality education. Concern has been expressed, um, uh, particularly by children and young people, with regards to the lack of consistency in relationship and sexuality education, or RSE, across our schools. The Department of Education's current approach, which enables schools to develop their own policy within the curriculum, is contrary to the UN Committee's recommendation that meaningful sex sexual and reproductive health education must be part of a mandatory school curriculum for all schools in Northern Ireland. And additionally, it, con it contravenes Section 9 of the Northern Ireland Executive Formation Act of 2019, which requires the introduction of a compulsory RS RSE curriculum. The committee has already, um, with Autism and I, talked about restraint and seclusion, and, and I want to update, um, briefly update the committee on our work and happy to take further questions um, during our discussions. We have in NICI been concerned for many years about the use of restraint and seclusion in education settings. And we have, I can inform the committee, commenced work on a review of these, practicing, of these practices to ensure that every education in Northern Ireland complies with the rights of children and young people. To do so, we must ban the use of restraint and seclusion for disciplinary purposes. And this includes any technique designed to inflict pain. Ensure that restraint is only used as a measure of last resort to prevent harm to the child. And what that actually then means is we can see no justification for the use of isolation rooms in any of our education settings. And we must make the reporting and the monitoring of the use of restraint um, mandatory across all settings, bearing in mind what I've said about seclusion being banned um, outright. Finally, it would be remiss of me not to discuss the disturbances and riots over the last two years, over the last two years, over the last two months, actually, and over the last 30 years. 
Rioting is not a legitimate expression of concern. And I have no doubt that particularly at the beginning, um, around, uh, around about Good Friday, criminal act actors under whatever guise they, they chose to have exerted control and coerced young people into taking part in these disturbances. This is clearly a safeguarding issue as it harms young people as well as the com their communities and, active, and, and adversely impacts on their life chances. Young people and their communities need sustainable support and funding to progress existing action plans, including the Children and Young People Strategy and Recommendation B13 of the Tackling Paramilitary Action Plan. Children and young people must feel and believe that they are part of the process to ensure peace and, prog and that progress is sustainable in Northern Ireland. To move forward, they have to have a proper understanding of the past. And in this regard, our education system has been found sorely wanting. So that's as much as I want to say in my formal remarks. And I'm Arayd, Neve and Christine look forward to discussing any, uh, all the issues with you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Um, and thank you for covering such a wide range of issues. Um, hopefully you'll agree those are all issues that the committee uh, has sought to work with you on um, and, and to make priorities for, for our work program as well. There's a, a number of issues there that we will seek to take uh, forward action on as well, um, uh, particularly in relation to RSE, as you, as you mentioned there, the need for some key issues on that. Um, we, we hope for a, a motion in relation to RSE and indeed the, the restraint and seclusion issue as well, although that, that's uh, in, encouraging to hear of the, the work that you're already doing in, in relation to that issue. There are a wide range of educational issues that you touch on there as well that we share concerns on in, in relation to um, the uh, over-assessment um, and indeed the need for certainty with regards to uh, post-primary transfer arrangements next year. Uh, welcome on so your, your really clear comments in relation to the, the damage uh, done to children and young people through that coercive control in relation to rioting uh, and the need for real sustainable action uh, to empower our young people um, in relation to positive opportunities. Um, and the, you referred to the paramilitary action plan as well. It, it makes a number of recommendations, including um, uh, measurable targets uh, to integrate our education system, um, which I hope to see um, joined up uh, and uh, expedited in response to some of those uh, abusive uh, treatments of children and young people that we've seen in recent times. I'm going to I'm going to bring members in straight away here, Commissioner, in, in order to make sure we get through as many questions as possible. So I'll move to Deputy Chairperson Pat Sheehan, MLA. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and, and thanks, Kula, for that uh, wide-ranging, comprehensive presentation there. I, I wanted to just touch on the, the rioting there over the last few weeks. And uh, I agree, as you say, that there's a child safeguarding issue, and, and particularly when we see footage of adults, you know, encouraging and cheering on uh, young, in, in some cases, young children to to throw petrol bombs and rat and so on. But I was very struck by one interview I saw. There was a young lad uh, around about nineteen years of age who had been arrested, although was 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 later released. And uh, I'm paraphrasing what he said, but I was very struck by it because the young lad was very articulate and not the stereotype that some people would portray as, you know, young lo loyalist dudes. Uh, uh, he was very articulate indeed. But the paraphrasing, he was saying, you know, if people tell you you're losing everything, yeah, uh, yeah. And your way of life is being disregarded completely, and then somebody uh, sticks a petrol bomb in your hand yeah. to go yeah. through, through yeah. it. Well, well why yeah. would you? Yeah. You know, so it, it sort of, to me, it cut to the core yeah. of, of what, you know, the, the problem is here. Uh, and, you know, if, if, if children are being told, you know, you're you're irrelevant in society. Your way of life is being eroded. You're losing everything. Then what's left but to, to sort of go out on the street and run? And I'm just wondering, you know, would you like to comment on that? 
I think I think um, uh, you know to say uh, it's it's right to say that these are young people who it's likely that these are young people who w were at risk in the, in the first place. That, uh, you know that young people who um, uh, community activists, youth workers, social workers, uh, and others have been working very hard with already and and feeling disenfranchised and and poverty and the like the recession and the pandemic has made them feel more disconnected um so i i don't um i don't for one minute question that they that, that, that their feeling of marginalization i think that's that's absolutely right i think for me the question is how that's how they've been manipulated to to articulate that and to demonstrate that to uh, how that's been manifested because what we have seen is young people and, and you saw this at your at the committee a, a couple of months ago young people are very uh, uh, including these young people are able to articulate their concerns on mental health on climate change on poverty on black lives matter and and what we haven't done though what we haven't done and what what i meant when i said our education is wanted we haven't been able to help them and encourage them to have a more open conversation about uh, about what it, their culture, their identity, and when they feel that they have been uh, disenfranchised, been ignored, being discriminated against. And these are very legitimate concerns. Brexit is a legit legitimate concern. What, what's happened with some of the policing behaviours um, and, and COVID regulations are legitimate concerns. But they, the, the fact that they are vulnerable um, and disenfranchised means that they that they are vulnerable to manipulation. And that's what's happened. So I do, I do not want I do not want for one minute to say to dismiss the views of young people. Um, but I, I want the focus to be put on the adults who've coerced them to take part in criminal activity. But w what it, it is an example of, and you're right, uh, Pat, is that we, we don't listen. As, as well to our young people as we should. And and um, and what is, I just want to finish by saying what has broken my heart over the last two weeks is this is the image that has gone around the world of Northern Ireland and our kids. And that's not the Northern Ireland and children that we know they are, including those who are, who are writing. They are fantastic, vibrant, resilient, funny, funny young people with hopes and dreams that they live every day. And that's the image we need to portray to the world, not what they've seen in the last two weeks. Yeah, no, and I absolutely agree with you. And and I think, I think it was Billy Hodgson I heard saying that, that sometimes, you know, it's the perception that's more important yeah. than the actual absolutely. reality. And, yeah. and, and I agree with you completely that we need to listen uh, to these young people and listen to their concerns and try to allay their fears. Yeah. Uh, and, and and that's very very important. I, I want to move on to another subject quickly. Um, just you, you majored heavily there in your presentation on on mental health, uh, and uh, I have been advocating with the education minister that he should bring forward a broad ranging uh, strategy to deal with the fallout from the pandemic and you may be aware that uh, Professor Siobhan O'Neill, the mental health champion, was in with us some time ago and she agreed with the assessment that there's going to be a tsunami of mental health challenges coming out of this tsunami or coming out of this pandemic, sorry, and that, uh, you know, my fear is that the minister is going to rely on his uh, mental health and well-being framework that was designed and formulated pre-COVID, and it's not going to deal with the broad range of problems that are going to be there in the aftermath of it. Um, so uh, there has been some commentary in the media around a recovery curriculum, and I'd just mm -hmm. like to hear your, your views on, on those particular issues. Thanks. I'm going to say something very briefly and then pass on to the team. I think uh, the recovery curriculum um, is it works for some and not for others. Tell that to a year 12 who's who's that, who's in school at the moment doing three sets of assessments for every single GCSE subject they're doing. Uh, we've taken our focus off, off the mental health, but I'm going to hand over uh, uh, in the reality we've taken our focus off mental health. Um, but I'm going to hand over to Mairead or Christine, who may want to jump in with some of the details of, of, of this. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to mention, obviously, um, because obviously in terms of mental health and education, it's, it's a joint responsibility just, you know, between the Department of Education, the Department of Health, and obviously 
both ministers have responsibility there and to flag up as well that we will be speaking with the health minister in the very near future about this too, Pat, just to flag up the, the very same concerns that you, you've also articulated. Um, we're mindful there's a number of strategies that are um, currently being implemented around the emotional health and wellbeing framework in schools and so on and counselling provision we're hoping is going to be rolled out for younger children. But we're mindful as well that, you know, as you say, post this pandemic and, you know, while we want to see um, an end to the pandemic as such, we, we are going to have to adapt to our lives to coping with this and the threat of this in the future. So I think you're absolutely right. Fundamentally, mental health and emotional well-being of our children is key. And building their resilience is also going to be key as well, which is where our education in the classroom has a huge role. And schools, principals and teachers and education staff have a huge role as well. So I know that you think um, in terms of the mental health strategy that that may not answer all of the questions and the issues. But there's absolutely an opportunity here to prepare better for what may be coming down the track in terms of allocation of resources and how we actually approach this in a much more creative way. And I'm going to hand over now to Chris Ting, who's our lead um, on mental health in Nikki as well, to add her comments. Yeah, yes, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, Pat, you're making a, you're posing a really, really important question, and it's really great to see the amount of um, um, emphasis that um, the the Department of Education and the, and the committee are are placing now on children's mental health. Because um, when Nikki um, published its still waiting report back in 2018, we were really, really clear that in order to um, support children's emotional health, well-being, and address any issues that may arise um, for children, it needed to be a whole system approach. It wasn't just the Department of Health that needed to be thinking about um, what steps could be taken to to um, support children, young people, um, education communities, a whole range of all of the departments um, have a role to play. Um, so whenever the framework um, was published at early this year, we felt that there was potential in that. Obviously, it was, there was a delay in it coming out in the first place, but we felt that at least there was a plan there. There was um, funding, and not just funding, but recurring funding attached to it. Um, um, and what we said in the paper that was um sent to the committee in advance of our um, um, our sitting today was that we felt that it needed to be fast-tracked. We need to get lots of those um, projects and initiatives in place uh, as quickly as possible because of the impact that COVID is having um, on exas as, um, making children's mental health um, worse. Um, where they, um, those issues existed before and um, creating problems um, for, you know, new problems in terms of anxiety and stress for young people that they wouldn't have been there pre-COVID. Um, what I would say, which I think is important, is that there is um, a working group that was established on the back of the Mental Health Action Plan that came out um, at the beginning of the pandemic. And there's a lot of um, information being drawn together by that COVID working group, which is specifically set up to look at children and young people's emotional well-being and mental health and the impact of um, COVID. So there's a lot of information there that could be funneled through into the, the rollout of, the, of the, the emotional health and well-being framework that DE are leading on. So I think there's um, some co better coordination that could be done across those two pieces of work that could hit on some of the issues that you're identifying there in terms of immediate needs, in terms of supporting children and young people. Okay. okay, and and could I just come back in a minute, Chair, briefly? Briefly, yes, um, briefly, Pat. Please, thanks. I, mean, I agree with everything you're saying, uh, Christine, and 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 I have uh, actually asked the minister, in conjunction with the Department of Health and the Department of Communities, that there there is a cross departmental approach to the problems that we're going to be faced with after this pandemic, uh, and that they should come up with a, a, a cross-departmental strategy to deal with those mental health and well-being issues and make a bid for some of the COVID funding that we're going to be able to carry over into the next financial year. And the, the Minister for Finance has said that he will look very favourably on any bid for funding uh, to come from that fund. So, 
Uh, thanks again, thanks, Pat. all of you, for your presentation. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Pat. I just stepped in briefly. So, members uh, and our guests, I think we have 50 minutes max left to, uh, to available to us today and, and another seven MLAs to get through. Um, so, I just ask MLAs, out of courtesy to your colleagues, do your best to stick to our, our approximately five minutes that you each have to uh, engage with our, our witnesses today and heed my attempts at uh, bringing you to a close more than you usually do um, <laughs> in order to give everybody an, an opportunity to try and come in. Robin Newton, MLA, thanks. And, uh, thank the Commissioner and our team uh, for, for joining with us today. And <clears throat> I suppose what is a very, very important uh, time uh, for, for young people as indeed they uh, return to uh, school in, in, in particular. Uh, I do want to pick up on the theme, Chair, of a joined-up strategy. Um, and I'm pleased to hear about the work group on the mental health and emotional well-being. I think that that's useful and that the fact that they appear to be doing some good work, uh, as reported by Christine, that, that sounds to be good. Uh, and I do think, Chair, there, there is a need for um, an educational minister, perhaps led strategy, but indeed that it does need to involve health, it does need to involve community, and obviously it needs to involve support from uh, the finance minister in, in actually uh, providing the wherewithal to, to deliver uh, the programme. So I think the, the, the committee, uh, not wishing to speak for the whole committee, Chair, but I think that in past meetings we have uh, generally agreed that that is a appropriate way of, of hopefully addressing the um, anticipated educational gaps and indeed the mental health uh, areas. Can, can I maybe just ask, pose to to the, the commissioner and, and, and her team uh, two questions. First of all, uh, and you've made uh, on your, it's our, actually our page 52 of your report, overcoming the educational inequalities and promoting inclusion. The minister has established his working group on underachievement. Has the has Nikki been able to make a contribution to to that uh, report, uh, which I believe is at the interim stage, uh, working towards final report, Chair? Uh, I, I, maybe if that take that as a first question. Um, Thanks, Rob. Yeah. So can I can I say something about strategy? Because I'm 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 very wary of strategies because sometimes strategies can delay. We have the minister launched the executive on behalf of the executive the children young people strategy in November of last year. They're working on the action plan, uh, which is which which is a cross uh, executive cross departmental strategy, um, and they are working on the action plan. That action plan that strategy has to be for our children of the next ten years. Our children in the next 10 years are COVID recovery children. And therefore, that strategy has to be moulded to meet the needs of our children coming out of COVID. So I suppose absolutely we need a strategy and action plan. What I would say back to, to, to you, Mr Newton, and, and to, to Mr Sheehan beforehand, we have a strategy. We just need to we just need to make sure that the actions and the, the outworkings of that strategy meet the needs of our children and young people today. So I, so I want to say that because I don't want more civil servants going into dark corners writing strategies. Um, the panel on educational disadvantage. Yes, of course, we, we have engaged quite significantly with them. We, we, we made a, a substantial submission to them and I met with the panel uh, some months ago um, and outlining our, our range of concerns and issues and we intend to do so, if not more, so, to do it more extensively with the independent review that the Minister has also begun the process of, of implementing. So yes, we, we have engaged with the panel and actually have, have, uh, and, and have, have welcomed their, their recent interim report about some of the work they've done and, and delighted about the way they've included children and young people in, in their work. Okay, can I then, in terms of, uh, I'm, I'm sufficiently put back in my box now about the strategy, Sorry. so. I think, I, th I think the 
I think the committee was the concerns of the committee were around the immediate return to school. Yeah. And the yeah. immediate preparation for the next academic year. Yeah. And what we needed to do in the short term in, yeah. in, in, in how we could, could uh, yeah. assess our pupils uh, with, with, with that. But it's about a joined up approach, you know. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but I think uh, we are uh, definitely uh, on the same page, Robin. We're definitely on the same uh, page. I don't, I don't think education can do it on their own. I don't think no. health can do it on their own. No. Uh, I, I don't think communities can. Yes, uh, uh, absolutely. So we're, uh, um, uh, I've made my point now as well. <laughs> but I think we're, we're we're on the same page. Yeah, yeah. In, in terms of what is your knowledge or understanding at this stage, then, in the educational gaps or the mental health issues that young people are facing in the immediate term. Uh, and, and, and as they return to school and as we go through this uh, next number of months, cr critical number of months, I, I would argue. Just, just very briefly, I think that's the really critical question. The really critical question is we think we know, and until we actually sit down with our young people, we, we, we don't really know because we need to find out. Because some young people have been anxious, and that anxiety will, will be alleviated once they get back into the routine of education. For others, that anxiety will be exacerbated by getting back into the routine of education. And we won't know which one which one that, that does. What we do know, we have to be ready. Um, moving away from, from, from language like tsunami and influx and surge and pan, uh, mental health pandemic, what we are hearing, we are hearing far too many voices saying we are stressed, we are isolated, we are anxious, we, you know, we can't sleep. To, to ignore that. So we had a waiting list problem before this started. Um, so uh, we are concerned about the ability of our child and adolescent mental health system to be able to respond adequately to, the, to, to, to referrals. And if they can't, then we need, we need robust um, community and voluntary sector services to be able to do so. But the other thing we need to do is we need to pause some of the academic stress we're placing on our young people and embed within education for those who can avail of it within education and outside of education for those who need it outside. And we need it to continue throughout the summer months. We can't just stop uh, when we have them all and then let them all go home without making sure that they've got some. But it's difficult to know. It's difficult to know until we hear from young people now we're seeing them all again. Bear in mind we only started seeing them all on Monday. Um, I think that we would want ETI, we would want Education Welfare Service um, and, and EA to, um, to be working very closely with their schools and obviously the Independent Counselling Service to be working very closely with schools, including primary schools, to, to find out what it is the children need and to respond very quickly. Um, okay. and, um, and we need to know where the funding is around the education, um, the, the emotional health and wellbeing framework. Sorry, does okay. anyone else want to jump in, bearing in mind I've taken sure. up all the time now? Sorry. Sure. I'm going, to, I'm going to have to, Robin, apologies, I'm going to have to keep us moving here, but you'll, you'll forgive me at a later date. Thank Absolutely. you for those really pertinent questions, Robin. Can I bring in Daniel McCrossan, MLA, please? Thanks. Julia, you and your colleagues are most welcome. It's always a pleasure to hear uh, of the great work that you're continuing to do, and uh, we follow you very closely. Um, you're very strong in the points you make publicly, and, and I think you've been very, very good in how you've assessed the recent violence on the streets of Belfast and Derry and other places. Uh, and you're 100% right. It's child exploitation, it's, it's child abuse, uh, and it, it should be stopped immediately. And this is about scratching the surface to see what really is going on in these communities. And I think you've been very, very clear and very, very good on that. So thank you for being a strong voice for young people across Northern Ireland. You've been monitoring the impact of the pandemic on children and young people's rights and have highlighted many of the concerns we have had here on the Education Committee. For example, the slow rollout of additional devices and free Wi-Fi and issues relating to uh, consistency and quality of remote education. And we've, we've spoken about that in the past. As you know, our young people are facing their GCSE, AS and A levels uh, and are now engaging in assessment procedures uh, designed to provide evidence to enable them uh, to be awarded grades. I have big concerns about this, raised it with the Minister and with Justin Edwards of SIA. Are you, as the Children and Young Persons Commissioner, satisfied with the processes put in place by the Minister and SIA to award grades? Secondly, 
Do you believe these will be fair for all of our young people? Uh, and thirdly, are uh, there any other aspects of the processes uh, that you would give uh, cause for concern? Thank oh you. Goodness. Are you sure, um, Chair, I only have a few minutes to answer this? So um, I think what SEER published was was okay um and and um I, i'll let colleagues jump in do i think it's been implemented appropriately properly in schools uh what, what I, as i as i said in my opening remarks no i don't um where what they <clears throat> what see what see said they offered a range of methods by which evidence could be submitted for young people's work one of which was controlled assessments and uh in in school what they have assured us, they told principals, was that controlled assessments wasn't the only the, the only method and shouldn't be used, but they were offering it as advice. What we're hearing from some schools is that that message doesn't seem to have got through. Uh, what we're hearing from some young people is that message hasn't gone through. So I'm loath to say it's here. I'm loath to say it's schools. I'm loath to say it's DE, but there is something wrong with 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 what's been what was issued as guidance and what has happened with implementation in some schools because we're hearing from children that they are being assessed constantly and that, it, that it, it's everything uh it's exams but every in in every way but in, but in name so um that's when then we come to the fairness issue I think we need to question then: Is this fair? And again, SEER have assured us that they that they they're planning to introduce some robust quality assurance processes. But bearing in mind what we what we went through last year, mm -hmm. I think um, we do not want to be where we were last year when on results day it suddenly became apparent. Um, uh, I don't want to use the word debacle, but that the situation was was less than satisfactory. Um, just very quickly, do um, any uh, uh, Mairead or Neve want to jump in um, on anything I may have missed? I think one of the biggest fundamental issues, as Kula's has already said, is really about the consistency and how this is being applied across all schools, because that's going to be vital in terms of establishing a level playing field for pupils. Um, and obviously, um, as Kula's has already highlighted and we've highlighted previously, with SEA, there needs to be that robust monitoring and quality assurance to make sure that children aren't um, you know, treated unfairly or feel that they have been treated unfairly as a result of the processes now taking place. Um, I'm mindful, you know, one of the reasons that Nikki called for a focus on wellbeing was because of the pressures on children during the lockdown periods and also because they need to be focused on wellbeing and mental health for children coming back into school. Um, unfortunately, as you've heard earlier already, there has been a move towards let's start looking at this assessment cycle already and staff are already and pupils are already feeling under pressure. And we do get cases through our legal department highlighting um, the pressures that children and young people are feeling as well. Uh, I think Neve also wants to come in here as well, Neve. Yes, just on the point um, of consistency and considering the implementation of the guidance, in absence um, of the publication of the appeals policy, which we know is going to be coming soon and we'll be advising on that, what we would recommend and call for is for schools to be very clear and to communicate with pupils and their parents about the policy for determining grades, to be very clear on the evidence that will be used and the process for internal standardisation. Daniel, can I, if I just come in briefly on that as well, I'll, I'll try and give, be uh, flexible with time here. But the, we we'd raised a couple of times with the minister and with Sia, um, and and look, the, the school. It's this isn't the fault of schools. To be clear, you know, uh, the minister said um, there would definitely be exams, um, so don't overassess. Then he said there um, there won't be exams, um, and then the guidance. For whatever the minister and say have tried to do via social media videos and uh, and otherwise has text in it that that places higher yeah. value on con on continuous assessments. So I, I, this isn't the fault of the schools, but the key question that we we've been asking is who, how, and who is monitoring the implementation of the guidance? And I, I I don't get an impression that really anyone is. And I know we've got to trust our teachers, trust our schools, but. It, there does seem to be a, a big, wide inconsistency with regards to how that guidance is being implemented. And without some form of monitoring, I don't see any way to 
respond to that. So go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Chair. I, I'm very, very fearful at this stage, given what I have heard, what I, uh, and given the young people I've spoken to in schools as well, that we are directly headed for the same direction as last year, uh, and the, the signal points seem seem to, seem to be aimed in that direction. Uh, like, the, the, there's children, young people speaking to me, saying that their assessments at GCSE yeah. have doubled, have doubled. Yeah. And yeah. they're ringing me directly to my office, desperate to speak to me, asking me, can I do something about it? That is a clear warning sign that these young people are under immense pressure. And I'm not just talking about uh, 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 children from certain circumstances, people right across the board, children yeah. with support or without it. But I do have a concern in terms of th this language used around the, 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 the fair playing pitch or the, the, uh, the level playing field. Level playing field that the minister keeps using. There is no level playing field yeah. in relation to this issue because yeah. the reality is the children who have support at home, whose parents can afford uh, tuition, will do better than those children who want to do better but don't have those supports. And the yeah. Department for Education and the Minister have a responsibility to those young people to protect them and ensure that they have an equal and fair chance at doing their best. And I don't believe this current system is going to do that. I think, really, uh, Kula, we're headed for the same direction unless something is done. And I know okay. that as we emerge closer, they, they don't Dan speak for Daniel, it. I'm just going to advise time is almost up. If you if you have a final, final comment or question, you want to yes. add in. Okay, thanks. I, I, do. I, I do. Thank you, Chair. Uh, in, in relation to the pandemic and how mitigations were put in place to keep our children and young people safe by going to and from school as well as while they're in school, Kula, are you satisfied that the Department of Education, the Education Authority and schools have always done enough to protect the children and young people? I'm thinking of this in the context of nursery, primary, post-primary and special schools. And now that they've fully reopened, do you feel that the Minister has done enough in that regard? Thank you. So we we're currently looking at this um, in a really in a far more in depth comprehensive way. So I I don't want to preempt the findings of the report we're going to publish in in June, uh, at the end of June. And um, Neve Neve particularly, but but Maraid and Christine and and others also <clears throat> working very hard, including speaking directly with young people about their experiences. Have I been frustrated? by the way schools close? Have I been frustrated by the way announcements have been made? Have I been frustrated by hearing from teachers and school leaders and children about the way they've been informed about decisions? Do I, do I think particularly around children with special educational needs and disabilities, do I think we, we could have served them better in the first and the second lockdown, second set of closures for schools? I absolutely do. Do I think we needed to do more for our vulnerable children? I absolutely do. I think we, we could give a little bit of leeway at the beginning of this, but I think there's going to be a lot of learning coming out of this. I don't want to preempt recommendations that, that, that we're going to make in July, but I, I think that there have that there have been significant concerns. And one of them, Daniel, has been around the way that some decisions were made without proper consultation without proper consultation about, of, with bodies like mine, but with also without proper consultation with children and families. And I think that's regrettable. Okay, Daniel, sorry, going to have to move us on. If we miraculously have more time, I'll try and come back to people. Robbie Butler, MLA, thank you. Hey, Chair. Um, hello, Nikki. I'll not name all your names, but thank you for joining us today and for the fabulous work you do. Um, genuinely, in terms of the, the commission, the leadership and the, the, the focus that you put on certain topics um, has been exemplary, genuinely has. And um, first part isn't a question because it was Daniel's piece and what you just alluded to there, Kula, which was the lack of consultation. I was literally going to ask you initially were lessons learned and did we react? And I mean, this committee also has a role to play. The minister is not an island. He's not solo. There's crossovers. And we have a responsibility as a committee to to make sure that we pick up the right uh you know the right threads and make sure that we bring the right focus on from my perspective genuinely you guys have been absolutely the voice and the advocates for, for young people and i'm not saying it to be nice genuinely not because i'm wasting my own time here by saying it but i just want to give you that that sort of validation if you like that you have been on track and i agree with the the lack of consultation piece i think that's been for me there's no perfect answer to any of this if we look at academic selection last year and cool mean you've slightly different perceptions on what that is. Um, again, um, the lack of the ability to find a suitable solution is regrettable. To what have we learned? I'm not going to ask you a question on this year's academic selection, but we need to learn from what went wrong last year, and we need to make sure we put the children at the centre of this. So, so thank you so much uh, for all you do, guys. 
Um, I got a, there's a lot of um, psychologists, leading psychologists have been, um, they've coined the phrase that we need to emotionally regulate before we educate. Certainly, we can see with the push towards A-levels and GCSEs and that assessment happening as soon as they get into school. But obviously, there are literally a, a, a hundreds of thousands of other pupils in there too. Do you believe that our schools are adequately resourced and able to do that, um, Kula? Because I know that the, the, the committee agree. Uh, I know that you guys agree. Uh, and you had said at the start about assessing each pupil basically on their return to see where they are. Do you believe we can do that? I mean, uh, and if... How would we support schools to be able to do that um, over this next number of weeks and months? There's a one word answer and, and there's a longer answer. So I'm going to hand over to Mairead and Christine to give you the longer answer and then I'll give you the one word answer at the end. Um, Mairead, Christine. Um, I mean, I suppose it's, it's really looking at the practicalities that you're talking about, Robbie, because you're absolutely right. It's fundamental that children are education ready before we start to try and educate them. And I know that teachers are well aware of this as a former teacher myself, I'd have to say that. Um, but I do believe that it is absolutely key that we focus on where a child is at and where a young person is at when they return into the school setting. Um, is it possible for schools to do that? Well, I would say absolutely it is because I think the teacher's role is very much to know their pupil. Um, and I know that teachers are very committed to making sure that they support their children in the appropriate way. And in doing that, you need to see exactly what the child has been dealing with while they have been absent from the classroom as such. And as people have already pointed out, there has been a range of inequalities that we've been flagging up in terms of access to resources, access to Wi-Fi, access to digital devices, which we know in conversations with the Education Authority and the Department of Education more recently has been hopefully resolved, but we know there are still ongoing issues. Um, but in, a, in a, I suppose a short answer to it, can that be done? I believe it can be done. I believe the will is there for schools to make sure that they support their children to become education ready. And I think the focus on well-being and emotional well-being and mental health should have been the priority when children came back into the classroom on Monday in terms of the other years that hadn't been back in so far. Christine, do you want to add? Yeah, yeah, and <clears throat> just uh, briefly, I think I would um, take off where we um, finish them, read and saying that okay. in terms of emotional regulation and looking after the, the well-being of children, I think teachers play a huge part and there's an awful lot of, of young people that will come back into school and that reassurance from the teacher will just be enough to help them get onto the right path again and, and settle them. Um, for some young people, that won't be the case. And for those young people, then schools need to be supported to be able to reach out to those multidisciplinary teams, other allied health professionals that need to come in and support that child and to support the school to support that child. Um, we know that happens in Northern Ireland very, very well in many schools, but we know that there's inconsistencies. Um, and now is the time, um, I often think of the silver linings that COVID has brought. We, we know what can be done when it has to be. Um, we know if we think about CAMS and the introduction of online um, consultations, more um, telecommunication work, which is working for a lot of young people. And that's something young people are calling for for a very long time. And the SIMS system was saying that it couldn't be done or even in appointments for young people. And now we know that is coming on board. So um, the point I'm trying to make is, is that um, we really do need now to push the boat out and start thinking about how we can change systems and how services work to support um, young people's um, well-being as we come out of, uh, or as we move through COVID and whatever the next stages will look like. But um, yes, um, teachers can do an awful lot, but they also need support. They need to be linked, be, be able to connect out to all those other health professionals that um, play a part in supporting the well-being of children. Um, but we need to make sure that all children are able to get access to that. The framework, the educational, the new wellbeing framework um, has identified those sorts of building blocks within it. Um, but we need to see those fast, fast tracked, as I said at the beginning. I don't want to um, create the impression to the committee that we think the framework's go going brilliantly. It's going way too slow. There's a lot of uncertainties around um, things like formal governance structures around it and how it's going to be monitored, evaluated. Um, there's easier wins such as um, extending and building non-existent programs such as RISE and REACH. But there's 
really, really um, challenging aspects of the framework, such as building wellbeing into the curriculum for children, building it into um, teacher training. Those things will take longer, but they're absolutely foundational to um, all those other things, all those other kind of easier wins in, her, in the framework. Um, so I just wanted to... I'm glad I've got that opportunity to say that, that there is, we need to see more progress with that framework because it is critical as one piece of support for uh, students and pupils. Thanks. Fine. Final question, please, Robbie. Thanks. Yeah, no problem, guys. Um, thank, thank you so much for that. So, um, again, m most of it has been touched on, but I'm thinking in particular in and around special schools, and there was a lot of debate in and around special schools and how um, we you know, how, how they operated and what the facilities are now. I know you've covered a little bit of it, Kula, which was regards, I suppose, to the special measures and stuff that the, the minister had to adopt and perhaps the lack of consultation around that. If you could give us a short, maybe a short synopsis of what yeah. it could believe to be, uh, if there are any further lockdowns, which there might be in the autumn time, you know, we, we just don't know how COVID's going to be. So thinking about lessons learned, what use would be as a committee and what, what focus can we bring on to the think, and particularly with special schools? Oh, okay, very, very quickly, because there's not going to be a third lockdown. I have decided that's it. <laughs> we, we are not lockdowns, no more lockdowns. Um, and but I think that there has to be real, uh, real questions around support for staff, around confidence in staff uh, to be able to attend, about ensuring and spending the next few months in preparation for any further closures or, or, or suggestion of closures of having um, substitute and backup staff to be able to go in when there are when there are staff absences, of making sure that schools uh, have the proper equipment and cleaning, making sure that parents and children themselves are confident in going. There is a confidence issue here, Robbie, particularly for amongst staff and amongst parents, um, but also having direct communication between schools and EAs, EA and DE saying this is why this is why we can't offer the full the full curriculum tomorrow and this is what we need and those measures being in place. So confidence in stuff from staff and and parents and children, making sure that there there are backup and substitute staff to be able to go in, whether it's care staff or education staff, making sure the equipment is there. And obviously making sure that all our, our school staff are, and, and our parents are, are and are, are vaccinated. And as soon as we get a vaccine for, for young people, particularly young people with complex needs, then um, I think we'll be more confident. But I think we weren't able to provide the backup. We didn't have a plan B. We just yeah. said open and we didn't have a good enough plan B and we need the plan B because there's been a lot of learning coming out of this. Thank okay. You. Thanks, Thank Robbie. You. Thank you. Uh, bring in William Humphrey, MLA. Thanks. To your attendance and your presentation this morning. Um, just turning to the disappointing and disturbing scenes in our streets last week. Um, uh, it's very, very sad to see any young people involved in that, although we need to keep it in perspective. It is a small number. Nevertheless, it is very, very disturbing. Uh, and I just a couple of positives, I think, that come out of that. Um, like myself, my colleague, Councillor Dale Pankhurst, comes from a working class background and attended the same school as I did, Boys Model. And he did some media interviews last week, uh, Sky and other outlets, around his particular um, story. He was politicised through the flag protests. And Dale, uh, during his interview, articulated that he took the view that it was important to get educated, to engage and to empower himself and to take forward his frustrations and concerns and beliefs through the democratic process. And I would encourage all young people to do the same thing. He's completed his degree and is currently working uh, on his doctorate. He's now been elected to the Belfast City Council and is indeed deputy leader of the DUP group there. So I would encourage young people uh, in, in the community to follow Dale's uh, example and leadership. Uh, early this morning, I got a phone call from the principal of Springfield Primary School. Um, Springfield's primary school had civil disorder, riot, serious rioting on its doorstep last um, Wednesday and Thursday nights. And I visited the school along with the Lord Mayor on Friday morning. Uh, I want to pay tribute to Stephen Osborne, the principal there, and his team who've done tremendous work. And another positive is that uh, he, he phoned me this morning. Last week, last year, sorry, his school was awarded the most caring school in Belfast for 2020. He phoned me this morning to tell me his school has been awarded the most caring school in the United Kingdom for 2021. So uh, I think that um, 
when we talk about education ready, uh, this is a school on an interface between North and West Belfast, which was due for closure about 15 years ago and is now doing tremendously well. In fact, it is so successful, having had an extension, is still bursting at the seams and not big enough. So I want to commend the leadership of many of our of our teachers out there uh, around the, these difficult situations, youth providers, uniformed organisations, sports clubs and football clubs and so on for their work. Um, can I just turn to a question then, Chairman? And um, could you talked about education inequalities and uh, you used the term a need for significant transformation of the system in Northern Ireland. Could you perhaps put some meat in the bones of that for me, please? Uh, yes, yes, of course, um, and um, we have written substantially, substantially and significantly o o on this area. I think we know that there are groups of young people who are disadvantaged by our, our education system. They uh, they include working class children, particularly those on free school meals, and and we know boys, particularly in Protestant working class boys. Um, particularly, they include young people from some uh, black and minority ethnic communities, but particularly travellers and, um, and and Roma young people. They include young people who are have been looked after by, by the system, young carers um, or, or also, um, and other young people, such as uh, young people who identify as LGBT, who find school... Uh, uh, a less than nurturing experience. Um, so we, we know there are groups of young people who uh, significantly underachieve, if, if we use that language. There is also, it's well written, um, whatever you, you, you think about it, whether you're for or, or have concerns about academic yeah. selection and our two-tiered approach that we need to, we need to review and revise. And, and I'm very happy to come back to the committee and have a much, much, much more robust debate uh, about academic selection. I think it's also fair to say that our, our religiously segregated system um, is also um, uh, leads uh, to, to divisions within our communities, uh, and that does reflect our, our segregated communities and particularly social housing. Um, and um, whilst we know that those young people who, who attend grammar schools do exceptionally well and, 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 and the best amongst the UK academically, what we also know, and, and it's a well, it's a well-worn phrase about the long tail of underachievement. Those who don't do well do exceptionally badly, and the the, the gap between what we, we'll call the haves and the have-nots is far too wide to be able to be palatable to any of us. Um, and we education is not just about testing well. It's not just about five GCSEs at A to C. Education is about holistic and rounded human beings, about giving young people that confidence, that resilience that belief and also about their emotional well-being and until, until we have an education system that values those aspects um, and, and not just academic ability and I'm not saying we should we should we should ignore that of course we shouldn't until we have an education system that does that then we, we, we won't be ha we won't have a system that's fit for the children for, for our children or nor one that our children deserve so I, I suppose in, in a nutshell our education is is riven with divisions and I'm hoping the independent review that the minister um, uh, has has um, implemented uh, coming out of NDNA will begin to um, again articulate those divisions, but also um, identify the way forward. Well, I think Dr. Noel Purdy's Purdy and his team's report, which is due, I think, in May, is is hugely important in that context, uh, and I, I look forward to that with interest. You also talked about sustainable support and funding. In terms of in terms of um, uh, young people, um, can I suggest this is something which is not just a matter, uh, an issue for the education department, but across Absolutely. government? Would you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely yeah. agree. Um, I think stop starting funding, piecemeal funding. Um, you know, we know the piece. The, the, the current round of peace is going to end and there's going to be a gap between the next one starting. That's 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 not helpful. Um, and also um, uh, initiative and fad overload is also would also, you know, inconsistencies is, is also of some concern. So um, it, we need sustainable um, services and supports in communities that are informed and driven by young people and those community activists, youth workers, uh, schools who, who, who meet with and work with and interact with those young people every day. It needs to be driven by them.
Yeah, the point I will finish with this, Chairman. The point I made when Professor O'Neill was in front of the committee um, a number of weeks ago was that um, as we come out of uh, lockdown and the regulations that are currently in place, uh, we do need to have those interventions. Um, and, and whether there, there's over the summer months, there's those interventions need to be joined up in terms of government, local government, uh, community, uh, youth, uniformed organisations, sports clubs, and so on, because young people have been. Um, uh, restricted in so many ways, and and this is important not just for their 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 mental health, their spiritual health, their 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 physical health, and, and obviously educationally as well. Thanks, Chairman. Thanks, that William. Can I bring in Nicola Brogan, MLA? Thanks. Thank you, Chair, and again, thank you, Kula, Maria, Neve, and Christine for joining us here this morning, this afternoon, or this morning. Um, I'd first of all, I'd like to say, Kula, thanks for bringing up um, restraint and seclusion. We've already discussed this this morning briefly, but um, as you may be aware, the committee had formal briefings and informal briefings from parents and advocates, um, parents of children who'd suffered um, restraint and seclusion incidents and advocates for change um, up to the law um, around restraint and seclusion. So I'm really pleased to hear that the Commission um, have like reviewed it or in the middle of reviewing it and have called for a ban on restraint and seclusion as, as a disciplinary measure um, and want all incidents to be recorded. I think that's so important and as I've said before, I think it's really shocking that incidents aren't reported. There's no you know, it's not mandatory to report them. Um, this morning's briefing from Autism and I was focused on staff training, um, so teacher training and um, classroom assistant training that on autism in particular, which I think would have a real positive impact on um, restraint and seclusion and the teachers and staff involved should know how better how to communicate with kids with autism in particular um, in that case. But um, can you think then or of any other ways or how would you like um, it to be developed so that we can ban um, restraint and seclusion as a, like a disciplinary measure? So um, the, the, we have to ban it. We absolutely have to. We have to ban it. And, and as I said, the use of isolation um, uh, for children is is outright. But you can understand why sometimes restrictive practices holding a child or restraining a child may be necessary if 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 they if they if they pose a risk to themselves or, or or other children. So you you can see a scenario where that will happen for the shortest possible time. Um, and and what we know is uh, it's not just training; it's space and time in classroom to be able to be inclusive, to give children time to be able to express themselves, to have time. You know, my daughter just to say, my daughter is training to be a teacher, and she was telling me. Uh, about an incident um, when she was on the, on her practice teaching of a child who was being very very um, uh, robust and very active in school and and the the classroom assistant was able to take him out and just let him run around the playground um, and so you're you're absolutely right there needs to be good training good techniques good support and space in the classroom to enable teachers and and classroom assistant and others to be able to. To identify the child, who you can see, you know, you you know the uh, you know the child, you know the early warning signs, you you know their triggers if, if they have them, um, and so that will mean smaller class sizes or enough adults in the room to be able to identify the children who who, who may need a, a additional support. And and it's about being inclusive of all our children and young people. There's no such thing as a bad child, and we need we need to naughty children, bad children. Um, there's, 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 um, we need that message to be clear and we need to make sure we support our school and, and, and our school staff uh, with, with training and with techniques and with space to be able to implement those techniques, Nicola. Um, but uh, I'm, we have to ban them. We, we have to be clear. We need a policy. A 22-year-old policy is not good enough, particularly when it's as weak as woolly as this one is. Cool, I absolutely agree with you and I think it's um, I want to be a voice for those parents that have contacted us and I think you're a great voice for it Thank so you. I do really appreciate that so we'll keep working on that together the other issue I want to bring up that you touched upon um, at your briefing was about relationships and sexual education we had uh, we debated a motion in the assembly before Easter about the violence against women and girls strategy and part of that, they're focused on the need for like greater um, relationship and sexual education within the curriculum um, and kind of more focus on that there. So just I would like to hear your viewpoints on that, please, Kula. And anyone else? Talk, talk yeah. about it. 
Yeah, just to say very quickly, we need to have a mandatory curriculum. There's no other part of the education curriculum where we have a pick and mix approach in the way we do with RSC. Of course, in, with relationships, there there are some issues around beliefs and, 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 and parents have a role to play in that. But actually, we can still teach quite a lot. Uh, that that is that can fit into a curriculum and that it doesn't um sh shouldn't um challenge people's beliefs and and faith and, and and i would never want to do that and and we know that in england and wales they are introducing mandatory a mandatory uh, curriculum for young people um in schools and and have a, a process with parents as well but also nicola there is a piece of law that says we have to do this and that law come July will be two years old. So I'm, I'm, I am challenged and I have had discussions both with the Secretary of State uh, before the return of the Assembly and, and, and the Minister about the fact that we have a piece of law that says we have to have a mandatory curriculum. And two years after that law was passed, we haven't actually done anything significantly about it. And that is a cause for concern and fits very neatly into the whole issue of, cons of consent and violence uh, and abusive relationship, and particularly violence to women and girls, because we cannot assume that what's going on in our homes will give our children the best messages about relationships and consent and sexual health. Because do you know what? I'm not, as a, as, as a very liberal mother of two daughters, I'm not sure I'm the best person to teach my girls uh, uh, about healthy sexual relationships in view of the fact I don't want them ever to have sex ever and they're both adults now. Um, and so it, sh it needs to be done from somebody who, underst who who is trained and is confident, but also in partnership with families and parents. And I don't want to be trying issue but but genuinely we this is this is so important and we can't we can't leave parents alone to do this i don't know if anyone else wants to jump in there just uh, in support of what you've already said Kula, there it's absolutely vital that we see this in the context of healthy relationships because we wouldn't have violence against women if we didn't have the prejudices and the attitudes that we have in society so educating our children from a wrong, young age around respect for each other is absolutely fundamental, which is why this part of the curriculum is so, so important. I think sometimes there's too much focus on the sexuality side of it, and people don't understand it's about relationships, and sexuality is part of a, a healthy relationship. But it is very much about education, education, education. Um, and it is very much what we want to see in terms of changing societal attitudes and reducing violence against women in the journey towards eradicating all violence against all women. Um, the concerning thing is that we see in young girls today that there are attitudes that still exist among our young people that we do have to challenge. And we can't do that if we don't have a mandatory curriculum that's effective and appropriate and age appropriate as well. Okay. I'm nodding furiously with both of you. Um, I agree with all that there. The only other point I would like to make is, as well as it being mandatory, it should be standardised so that all schools... Yes, I know, absolutely. It should be okay. part of a curriculum that's recognisable and trans... Yes, it should be in the same way the maths curriculum is um, and, and, the, and, and the history curriculum is and whatever. Absolutely, it should be standardised. Yes, yes, of course. Great, thanks okay, uh, very much for that, Kula. Thank you. Thanks, okay. Nicola. J Justin McNulty, MLA. Hey, guys. Uh, good after. Oh, sorry, good, still good morning, Kula, Red, Neve, and Christine. Thank you very much for your evidence. Um, just on what was being discussed there, I spoke to Women's Aid at length um, a month back or so, and what they want to see delivered through our education system is teach teach children and young people about trust, equality, respect, consent, and health relationships, and that really should be part of our curriculum. Kula, what, what is your perspective in terms of um, the impact of this pandemic? How do you see this? What is the, what's, what's the outcome going to be for children and young people in terms of how it actually will impact them, given that, that there are many kids who are not from as balanced a background as others? And a safe and, and a, as educational environment as ours. What's what's going to be the impact, the long term impact for those children? 
Oh, God, that's a big question. Um, as I said, Justin, uh, we're, we're going to publish um, uh, a more comprehensive report in June. I can feel I can feel the team panicking every time I say comprehensive. Uh, um, don't panic. Um, I think it's difficult to know what the impact is. But let me tell you what what I think um, the lessons might be. The lessons, uh, what, what the pandemic has shown us, as, as, Bo, as I've said into sharp relief, is the inequalities in our system, particularly with regards to poverty. I can, I can sense a, a, a different discourse, a discussion and debate with regards to poverty and children who are socially disadvantaged. And, um, and we're moving away from the blaming of them or the ignoring of children and blaming their parents. And, and we're understanding that by ignoring or, or not doing enough to lift children out of poverty, you know, whether you're talking about digital poverty, whether you're talking about free school meals, whether you're talking about period poverty, the one thing they have in common is that those homes do not have enough money in them and that children are impacted on. So I suppose for me, I, I, I wanna sort of end on, a, on an upbeat note by saying is we need to learn the lessons of the pandemic and we need to do what Sir Michael Marmot says is build back fairer. Building back better means building back fairer and making sure that the boat that all of our children are in has no holes and that that, that, race, that rising tide will lift all boats once we get back. And what it's taught us is we ignore our children and young people and those who know them best at our peril. And, and, and so, Justin, I want to be optimistic and say we must learn the lessons and work in partnership with those who work with children every day, who see children every day and with children and young people themselves in order to make sure we build back fairer for, for, for our kids. Okay, uh, I love that concept, could I build back fairer. And, and just put myself in, in the shoes of a young person, I think it's, it's the part of our society was most, which has been most adversely impacted as a consequence of COVID. Um, you said that there's no such thing as a bad child, Pula, and I absolutely agree with that philosophy, and it's a very powerful, powerful outlook. Um, tell me, what, what do you think? Um, I've read reading, reading your reports, reading your, your literature now, and there's, well, there's a lot of information in relation to mental, uh, emotional well-being of children. It doesn't relate at all to physical, Pula. I'm a bit concerned about that. Because okay. I think the whole body, the whole system is interlinked and interconnected. And kids have been deprived, not alone in the socialization aspect of school, but also the, the physical education piece of it, and also related to sport. And that's slowly starting to recommence, uh, but there still is no internal uh, indoors PE in school, but there's been a bit of a gray area on that uh, from uh, the guidelines. What is the impact of the lack of physical education and participation in sport and physical activity? Because some kids are not haven't got a policy propensity yeah. for sport, but physical activity is still crucially important for everybody, not, not alone kids. What's your perspective on how that can be promoted and, and, uh, and made mainstream more in our schools and to be linked, interlinked to the mental health uh, piece for, for children and young people? Because they are interlinked. Yeah, they are. They are. And, and you're absolutely right to point out that um, my office hasn't done much work on... Um, physical health um, in, in that way, although, you know, we're doing we're doing uh, some work on illness, but that's that's a different point. But you, you, you're right around sports and and uh, exercise and activity. We ha we haven't done. Um, and, and so I'm literally holding up my hands and saying that there's only so much there's only so much we can do. Um, and uh, but I would I would never underestimate the impact it has on physical well-being and emotional well-being of exercise um, and of being outside as well and play. Uh, you know, uh, Article 20, Article 31 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child talks about play and uh, and leisure and sporting activity and and sometimes people think that's the wishy-washy article, but it, it's just as important as anything else a child does because a child does need physical exercise. So as again, as we look at um, what we've learned from the pandemic, particularly, I was gonna say we're going into the summer months, but I forget we're in Northern Ireland and that doesn't actually always mean very much for outdoor activity. But um, uh, the, 
we we do need to open up our, our outdoor spaces. We do need to get um, our sporting activities going. And and a big plea to the girls on the back of last night's success that this is for for, for young men, young women, and, and those who identify as as neither. The exercise is for everyone, and um, and that that we should that that should be available, and also the importance of safe and open public spaces. Um, but yeah, we haven't we haven't said said as much as others have, nor done as much. As others have, but there's only so much my office can do. But I think your points are well made, and and we will we, we are more alert to it uh, than we have been in the past. Okay, just I would like to applaud the girls from last night. What a lift that is for them, for the, for their families, for the communities. It was extraordinary success, and well done to them. And Neil Tinley Labore, the work that they did to get there was extraordinary. Final final point, uh, Chair. Just Thanks, Justin. For one moment. Thanks. Um, you, you mentioned the meeting we had with the young people previously as a committee. What were the positives from that meeting? Did you you, you felt you know, you're obviously you're very uh, positive, you're very glowing about that that meeting, and we all really enjoyed that experience. But from your perspective, what were the, the real positives for the meeting? Right. Okay. So the positives for me was that you actually gave space to three hours. I think I'm right because I tried to watch most of it. Um, um, and actually just got distracted. It was it was the best thing on TV that whole week. Um, I, I think you gave space for those young people to tell you their experiences. You asked them what I thought were really great questions. You were very, as a committee, not just you personally, Justin, as a committee, you were very respectful to them. I could feel their, their heads lifting because they knew they were being listened to. Now, um, so I felt it was a really, it was one, like I said, one of the best things I've seen this assembly do uh, around genuinely listening to young people. Now, as I've said to the chair subsequently, um, the test of this committee is what you do with the information that those young people gave you, is how you 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 feed that that it wasn't a great just one great one off event that you feed that into all your work, that the voices of those young people remain ringing in your ears. And when you um, uh, uh, have others, particularly officials before you, that you represent what those young people told you was wrong with the system, was right with the system and needed fixing with the system. So I suppose why I felt so happy, I will use that word, so happy after that meeting, was because I felt it was the beginning of something, not the end of something. It was the beginning of you seriously weaving in the views and experiences of a magnificent group of young people. Um, and we will be keeping an eye on you following up and, and, and seeing how the, what they said to you during that meeting changes the way you do business as a committee. Thanks, Justin. Thank you very much. Thanks so no pressure Thanks. there. Thank you, Colin. Uh, Morris Bradley, MLA. Sorry, Chair. That's okay. That's you, Morris. Thank you. Hello, Logan. Listen, uh, folks, thanks very much for your presentation this morning, and it, and it still is morning, so uh, well mm -hmm. done. Look, a lot has been, has been covered by other members this morning uh, and by their presentation itself. Uh, and as we're hopefully coming out of this pandemic, to pandemic which has exacerbated the inequalities well documented pre-pandemic, uh, it's good to know the indications for 2021 suggest that pupil numbers have been increased. But is the education budget currently enough to deal with the increase in numbers as well as pupils and young people coming out of this pandemic and the extra nurturing, uh, schooling and interventions that will be necessary? to integrate people and young, and, uh, young people and pupils back into education and life in general. So therefore, could I ask what do you believe would be a preferred outcome through the transformation and review of education in Northern Ireland and in terms of curriculum, training, et cetera, and the fact that we have controlled, Catholic maintained, integrated and Irish medium strands of education prov provision here in Northern Ireland. I would be interested to hear your views uh, and what your preferred outcomes may be. Um, okay, um, so I, the, my preferred, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's difficult to be um, conclusive, but I think we need one education system. 
in Northern Ireland that meets the needs of all children and young people. Um, we will need to have some schools, for example, um, f for, for parents who choose to, that their children are educated in, in, in the Irish language. So we will need to have some differentiation within the system. But we, I think we're looking at one system one integrate or integrated shared whatever that the the children do not have to travel an extra 130 million miles a year to to bypass to dr drive past lots of other schools to go to the school of their choice uh, i think parental choice and and ch child choice is incredibly important but the nearest school should be the best school for them um and that we need to leave our divisions behind do I think Northern Ireland as a shared society will be fixed by having an integrated education system? I think it puts far too much pressure on our children and education for a much bigger issue. But I think it goes a, a little way towards achieving that. I don't know if um, others want to comment, uh, Mairead Neve, particularly around funding, whether we think there's enough money in the system. I mean, I, I think because we've done reports on this in the past in terms of funding and education, we have flagged up the fact that there's not sufficient resources financially in the system and we're mindful even in speaking with officials, whether it's in the education authority or the department, that there is insufficient funding. And we are very keen and, and happy to see when, you know, additional resources allocated, for example, on mental health in terms of the emotional health and well-being framework. But what we have to see is that funding is sustained when it's shown that it's having the effect that you want it to have. In terms of transformation, um, I mean, that's a huge question, Morris. Um, and as Kula said, there's a number of big questions to be asked there and addressed. And obviously, as the review goes on, we'll be feeding into that. Um, and it is, uh, you know, the, the arguments we've made a number of times about the fact that we have a segregated education system, which is costing far more money than it needs to cost if it wasn't segregated. So, you know, we need to have those challenging conversations going forward as well. But what is fundamental is that at the centre of all of this, that we do right and protecting the rights of our children and young people in education and making sure that we realise the potential of every child and young person in Northern Ireland and do what we can effectively in meeting their needs. Because as we heard earlier, even before this session, there are children who have special education needs and they're not having their needs met as effectively as they could be. And that is obviously something that we'll come back to at the next session with the committee as well. Yeah. Chair, thanks very much for that there. Uh, I know it's not the answer, but it's, it is a building block uh, and it's one that I'm very interested in. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Morris. And Thank you to all our, our witnesses, Kula Mairead, Christine and, and Neve. Um, we could allocate a day to this session. Unfortunately, we don't have that available to us. But thank, thanks so much for your ongoing engagement with the committee. Um, hopefully you feel that's reciprocated from ourselves as well. There's a, a lot of issues there that we need to work effectively together on in the best interests of children and young people. Um, and I, I think it, it does. It is self-evident that the, the Education Committee is very much committed to achieving for children and young people and empowering children and young people. So we, we're, we're really grateful for the work that, that you're doing to, to promote that. And we wish you well with the, the, the comprehensive review, Neve, Christy and Marie, that uh, Kula has <laughs> set, set and trained for you. Um, and maybe we can, when, when, you, when you get that completed, we can re-engage with you on that as well as the important work on the set and frameworks as well. So th Absolutely. thanks very much indeed for your time Thank today. You. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, everybody. Thank thanks you. very thanks. much. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, if I could ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove witnesses and add members back into the spotlight and to ask the clerk to summarise any actions from that session. Okay, so the committee is very much on the same page. Actually, with the Commissioner, um, we uh, have a provisional um, arrangement that she, that she and her team will come back um, in the next month to talk about the SEND frameworks um, and we'll align that with the department's update on, on the SEND frameworks. Um, also, some of the issues that came up today were um, about RSE, um, about um, restraint and seclusion. Um, those are issues uh, on which the committee 
has has updates booked um, in the next weeks from the department and also um, has a commitment to um, to go to the, the House with committee motions um, on both of those. Um, so there was some interest in discussion about uh, disadvantage um, and funding um, mental health prevention and of, um, and of recovery. So I think really that's where the uh, innovation can be um, and it may be that the committee would want to do a motion about recovery. Um, the, the chair, you had... Um, yeah, no, I, 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 I think there's been a consensus from us all that there needs yeah. to be uh, a, an immediate plan and response for children and young people COVID recovery. I, I had been thinking myself and I, I think the commissioner makes an interesting point in terms of whether that requires um, a, a bespoke response or, or whether that requires um, targeted implementation of the children and young people's strategy. Um, I think a, a motion around that might help the Assembly draw some of that out and have a debate. Everyone's making very clear calls for recovery in terms of education, emotional health and well-being and, and physical recovery call for summer programs. I'm, I'm slightly concerned that the closer we get to that, that the sort of coordination you're going to need to see between school facilities, council facilities remaining open in order to facilitate some of that recovery may or may not be taking place. So um, perhaps, Clark, I, I could draft some text and bring that back to the committee in due course. Realise we're short for, for time today. Yeah, so I mean, I would just suggest that we thank the commissioner for um, her evidence and um, seek to schedule uh, her attendance again soon um, for the Zen Frameworks. Um, are members content with that approach? Agreed, members. Agreed. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Clark, we'll move promptly then to uh, are the rest of our correspondence and forward work programme before the end of the meeting. Yep. Yes. So just to invite, remind members that uh, our correspondence is at page uh, 81. We have 34 items of correspondence and a summary note at page 83. And I think we progress to agenda item 7.3, Clark, on page 95. We did. So members agreed earlier in the meeting um, that uh, we would write to the minister to ask what alternative arrangements are being made for um, the pupils of um, Brawla high school and um, for an update on area planning um, and again um, in our forward work program we should be hearing from the department soon about consultations on area planning um, in respect of mainstream and special schools. So um, item 7.3 then is a response from the department um, to recommendations made by the Belfast Youth Forum on relationship and sexuality education. Um, as I said the forward work program has an update from the department um, in the next uh, couple of weeks on relationship and sexuality education. Members, do you want to take any further action on this item? Members content to forward that response to the Belfast Youth Forum. And as Clark says, consider the update that we're going to receive in the next few weeks. Pat, did you raise a hand there? Or content? No, that's okay. Okay, members agreed? I'm content, Chair. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, items 7.4 and 7.5 are responses from the department to concerns on the minister's decision to withdraw approval for white jet qualifications for um, teaching in Northern Ireland schools from September 2022. Um, so again, members, are you content to note and forward that to the correspondence who raised it? Agreed. Okay. Um, item 7.6 is a response from the department about support for clinically vulnerable individuals and their families. Members, are you content to note and forward that to the correspondent who raised it? Agreed. Content. Uh, thank you. 7.7 uh, seven, seven is a response from the department on issues about planning for full school restart. Um, are members content to note and forward that to the correspondent who raised it? Thank you. 7.8 um, is a response about... Um, correspondence which proposed a public communication announcement strategy to help young people prepare for a return to face-to-face -to -face learning um, and if members are content to note that we can forward it to the correspondent who raised it. Great. Uh, thanks. Um, 7.9 um, on page 170 is a response from the department 
uh, to correspondence on a query um, regarding the decision by C2K to cease support for the virtual learning platform um, prompter. Um, members, if you're content uh, to note that, we can forward it to the correspondent who raised that issue. Agreed. Um, so maybe, think, maybe, uh, maybe in the full work program, we consider uh, some engagement with C2K as well, just around some of the wider issues. Um, Clark, did we ever get an update from the Department or the Education Authority with regards to the tender for um, the provision of digital uh, learning platform? No, no, we haven't been notified of the decision yet. Okay, that was expected quite some time ago. Could we, could we maybe chase that? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, item 710 is a response from the Department of Education um, to correspondence about um, lack of provision of A level Irish by CCEA. Um, members, if you're content, we can forward that response to the correspondent who brought it up. Agree. Agreed. Yep, yeah. thanks. Um, um, item 711 is. Um, the interim report of the expert panel on educational underachievement. Um, members mentioned um, their interest in that earlier in the in the meeting. Um, shall we propose? Shall we schedule a briefing on the interim report? Or yeah, I think it'd yeah. be good to invite yeah to invite the panel to give us a briefing on the interim report. Okay. Members content with that? Content. Can, can okay. just uh, thank you. Uh, yes, Rob. Sure. Yeah, just to uh, make my understanding. Uh, Nick Clark may be wrong in this. My understanding is that the final report is due out shortly. Would that be correct? Yeah, I'm just looking for the date actually, because um, that is obviously an option to wait until the final one. Um, yeah, that, that's logical. If, if it's going to be in yeah. due course, then probably would make more sense to do it that way, Robin. Yeah. If that's if we're, if I'm right, sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, if, yeah, if members are content, the clerk can check that uh, date for final report, and then we can decide whether to take a briefing in on the interim report or or wait until the final report. Agreed. Great. Okay. Okay. Uh, Thanks. Um. So. Then items 716 to 721 are responses from uh, churches and sectoral bodies um, on the teacher's exemption in FETO and the certificate for religious education. Um, there's still one response outstanding just from that um, bunch of correspondence. Um, so members, I mean, if you wish, you could wait to consider the replies in the round when that last one is in. Um, or we members can begin to now. Members content to wait until receive that final correspondence, and then we can agree um, which organisations perhaps to take some further evidence from. Content, chair. Content. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Clark. Um, thanks, chair. Item seven two two um, is a response from SIA regarding the alternative exam arrangements. Um, the committee asked for um, SIA's. Uh, confirmation that the five-step process provides the best opportunity, you know, at this time for, for um, pupils' future prospects. SIA have said that the five-step process um, is the best opportunity to ensure candidates receive grades commensurate with their academic performance. Um, and the, the letter also says that the appeals arrangements <clears throat> haven't been finalised yet, um, but are being finalised before consideration by the department. Um, so members, just um, are you content to note that pending a further response about the appeal system, or do you want to write back to see? That's it. Keep, we're content. I'd be content to note that, Clark. Um, uh, just to remind members as well, further to some of the issues that were raised in the evidence section that we, the committee has written to the education minister to ask who, who and how. Uh, the implementation of the assessment guidance is being monitored in a response in that regard. Yeah, and particularly um, to what extent controlled assessment um, is being carried out as a proportion of all of the assessment being done at the moment. Um, so, okay. Thanks, Clark. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
So item 723 is correspondence uh, from the Committee um, for the Economy uh, regarding alignment um, of the work of that committee and this committee. Um, so members, if you're content, I'll liaise with the clerk for the Economy Committee about that um, and just see where there are um, common uh, points of interest in our workflow. Agreed. Okay, agreed members, yep. Agreed. Thanks. Um, thank you. Um, and one I, one such uh, idea is um, item 728, um, which is correspondence from uh, the think tank Pivotal, um, providing a copy of its report retaining and regaining talent in Northern Ireland. Um, so members, I suggest that perhaps we would consider a joint briefing with the Economy Committee on that report. Agreed. Agreed. Thanks. Thank you. Um, item 729 um, is correspondence from the Council for Irish Medium Education um, seeking to brief the committee on the issues currently facing that sector. Members, do yep. you yeah, want to? Um, yeah, but members content to take a, a briefing from the Council for Irish Medium Sector. Agreed. Yes, Joe, can I, can I ask that we schedule that at the earliest opportunity? Yeah, we can program that in the forward work program section, uh, Pat. Happy enough. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, item 730 is correspondence from Linking Generations Northern Ireland, again seeking to brief the committee. Um, it's done some recent research on an intergenerational approach to improving skills and educational outcomes for children and young people in Northern Ireland. Um, Mem members Mem can schedule a briefing. Agreed. Agreed. Thanks. Um, um, item 733 um, and on page 436 of the pack and also on page 6 of table papers is correspondence um, about appropriate uniform for girls' health, hygiene and decorum, um, how a complaint to a school was handled um, in, re in relation to uniform um, and related matters. Um, now this complaint uh, has, has several strands. Um, the maladministration issue is being investigated by NIPSO at the moment um, and members will want to, uh, I suppose, make note of the policy point being raised, which is really the difficulties that can arise for pupils when schools enforce unsuitable uniform on growing teens. Um, but I would, there's also a value for money um, aspect to the, the correspondence. Um, so if members are content, I suggest we, we uh, acknowledge the correspondence and signpost um, the, the letter writer um, to the audit office in respect of the value for money concerns. Um, does that sound agreeable? I think that's a good idea to put it in the William Humphrey slot. <laughs> Okay. Um, thank you, Robin. Um, okay, so item 735 um, is correspondence seeking a meeting with the committee about the challenges um, being faced by voluntary sector outdoor centres. They've just sent a message through there. Two members, they are. Um, oh, are members consent to arrange an informal meeting with the voluntary um, sector outdoor centres? There's only five of them. Sorry, is that is that are members content to have an informal meeting with um, uh, the Urian Warren councillor about about the outdoor centres? Sorry, 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 sorry. I, I've lost my place. Just to know what page we're on. Um. Thank you, Martin. Um, we are on um, page 454. Um, and Pat, sorry, I hadn't noticed um, that the chair is out there for the moment. So are you, are you content to chair just for the time being? Uh, yes, uh, yes, it'll be no problem. Thank you. Uh, uh, well, I, I'm putting it to members. Are they happy to schedule an informal meeting? With Nuri and Morn uh, regarding the outdoor centres. Yeah. And Abby, yeah. Could, 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 could just rather than, I, I know 
perhaps nearly a more raised issue, but it might be a wider perspective on it. Um, we, the committee could also schedule um, a briefing from them from the sector uh, centres in, in its main meeting, if you wish, Robin. Yeah, I think that's 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 yeah, that's probably it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's do that. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Well, yeah. The correspondent. Sorry. Uh, can I, yeah, I make the point that I, I think Robin's right. I have um, for Easter, I was dining there, and there's some excellent outdoor centres. Um, in sorry, William. In, sorry, William. Could I interrupt you for a second? Could Could I ask any members who aren't muted to mute themselves, please? There's a lot of uh, feedback there. Thanks. Apologies, William. Go ahead. Um, I'm just I'm just saying that over Easter I was down south down there's some excellent outdoor centres there, uh, and I've used them in my own sort of scouting career. I take Robin's point on board. Um, I also think in terms of things that are owned by government or local government, we also have um, Crawfordsburn Scout Centre, which is owned by the Scout Council, not away over the boys' brigade, Lower Norn, owned by culture um, guides. Pally Horn by Scouting Ireland. So I think we need to take them into consideration as well because they've been devastated in terms of COVID and the implications from flowing from that, Chair. Thanks. Um, okay. Uh, thank you, William. So um, we create a, a forward program item basically for the um, voluntary sector. Um, yeah, okay, so the chair um, is unable to return. Um, Deputy Chair, just... Okay. Um, so, and, number three to that? Um, I was just saying, so we will sh we'll schedule um, a voluntary um, sector outdoor centre item in the main meeting, and um, then you can let me know particular um, centres that you're you're interested in to attend to that, to that one. All right. Okay. Um, Okay, so members, that's the um, correspondence disposed of um, just for now. Um, so, Deputy Chair, if you want to proceed there with the next agenda item. Yeah, sorry. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to find the, the chair's brief. Okay. So, it's agenda item eight next, members. Um, or just our forward work program. Uh, forward work program and, uh, sorry, refer members to the draft forward work program at page four, five, six. Uh, item seven point. Uh, sorry. Yeah, uh, so that there was an item in correspondence just at seven twenty four, um, which is relevant to the forward work program. Okay, that's that's correspondence from the committee for finance regarding the time scale for scrutiny of budget twenty twenty one twenty two by statutory committee. So, uh, this being the case, the committee is hearing from DE officials at its meeting on the twenty eighth of April. The members agree to receive research brief briefing for this item at an informal meeting of the committee on the twenty seventh of April at nine a.m. Are members happy to do that? Yep, content. Content. Okay, thank you. Uh, today, the committee has agreed to hear presentations from the Council for Irish Medium Education, linking generations NI, and the expert panel on underachievement. Also, the committee has agreed to propose briefings from Pivotal and on the 1719 strategy perhaps dealing jointly with the Committee for the Economy. These items will be provisionally scheduled in the next week's Forward Work Programme. Uh, the, the Committee agreed to endorse the Forward Work Programme as amended. Yes, sir. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, do any members have any other business? Yes, Chairman, can I raise an issue? You don't mind. Go ahead, William. 
Okay, um, during the meeting, I've received an email from, from a young man in Carrick, Fergus, and I, I haven't got permission to use his name, but I have got permission to raise the point he raises, I'm going about to raise here. Um, it was in relation to the presentation this morning there from Autism and I, uh, in response to a question that Mr. Butler asked um, in relation to um, mental health for autistic people. Uh, and the gentleman refers to, I can send the email on to the the clerk, but the gentleman refers to the response where the chief executive mentioned that the statistics were dire for autistic people with regards to mental health, but then wouldn't mention them, which would rather not mention them. Um, I think the gentleman writing has asked if we could pursue that and try and get the statistics. Okay, I received that email as well. Okay. Okay. So I'm happy to forward that on to the clerk, uh, and I've got permission to raise it there, so I'm happy to forward it on to the clerk. Thank you, William. So I'll forward okay. that on to the committee then. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> any, any other business from members? No? no. Okay, then. Uh, agenda item 10 is the time of next meeting. The next formal committee meeting is scheduled to begin Wednesday, the 24th of April. Uh, that starts at 9 30. Uh, and that's the end of business. Uh, members, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Deputy Chair.